Welcome to the November 16th, 2021 meeting, regular meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. It is 9 a.m. Uh, please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Here. Friend. Here. Here. Uh, and then the Pledge of Allegiance. In addition to deletions to the consent. layout 48 by 36 countywide map plan C Apple Hill East Harbor Scotts Valley Midtown layout 48 by 36 countywide map plan E ARC 21 proposed layout 48 by 36 countywide map also on the consent agenda on item number 43, uh, staff requests this item be deleted. Uh, we'll be bringing it back at, an, at a later date. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we have any announcements by board members of items to be removed from the consent of regular agendas? Seeing or hearing none? Uh, comments from Mr. Rara? No, okay. Uh, we will now go to public comment. Any person may address the board and speak uh, for up to two minutes on an item that is not on the, the agenda today or on a con today's consent agenda, closed session agenda, or yet to be heard items on the regular agenda, um, or uh, but not on a topic um, that is not within the jurisdiction of the board. We have a two minute limit. Yes, sir, please. James Ewing Whitman. Forgiveness for oneself, one's nation's lies, and not the unity and magneto bio, biologic power all human, all human beings have with respect to being good shepherds and with the living planet Earth. Yes, we are all able to make a choice as to what enemy to ultimately feed, good or evil. To ignore this truth is to abandon the souls inside us from before, but to further lose track of the souls that may choose to use our energy in the future. This is the greatest fear of those who are about 12 million currently on planet, planet Earth, collectively responsible for Earth's mass sixth extinction caused primarily by some white men who seem to have captured the rainbows of humanities to control through enslavement, all aspects and above this living earth. I'll comment on weather control later today. Longfellow, in the world's broad field of, field of battle, in the bivouac of life, be not like dumb driven cattle, be a hero in the strife. Headlines too big of a subject, but I would love to start with what is now in South Africa. I will not though. Falsehoods, no time. Love. Let's talk about love and the use of civic duties of lesser magistrates. We all are lesser magistrates. Think about parenting. I though will choose my interactions that support change, doing so by engaging with boots on the ground law enforcement. As law enforcement are the first to be thrown under the bus from their respective duties. 
not from their oath of office, offices to uphold the U.S. Constitution that was thrown out after being raped. Okay. California in San Diego issued an order in the case of Let Them Breathe v. Newsom et al. Um, so in that order, I encourage everybody to read it. Um, in the order, the court stated that the CDPH guidance on testing and quarantines is recommendation only. It's not a mandate and it's not required. Um, and the next thing the court also stated in their order was that schools cannot send students home or to independent study for failing to wear a mask at school. So um, I would like to urge everybody, everyone here today, especially the board members, um, if you guys could call and email, you know, Ferris Sabah and all the trustees, make sure our county guidelines here are in compliance with the law. So we have this new court order, and I just really want to encourage our county to be acting according to the law, according to this court order, because right now we're not in compliance with the law. Um, also, so last week in my comments, we had some Zoom problems, and I think that Zach and Ryan didn't hear my opening minutes of my comments from last week. So I'm going to go ahead and just start reading what I read last week to reiterate that, because it's really important. So on Tuesday, November 2nd, Senator Ron Johnson held a panel on the federal vaccine mandate and vaccine injuries in Washington, D.C. He invited the head of the CDC, Secretary of Defense Austin, Secretary of Labor Walsh, Secretary of Transportation Buttigieg, FDA Acting Commissioner Woodcock, HHS Secretary Becerra, NAIAD Director Fauci, NIH Director Collins, and the CEOs of Johnson & Johnson, Moderna, and Pfizer. None of them showed up for this hearing. Um, so um, Senator Johnson explained there's three realities that federal health officials, President Biden and his administration are ignoring. Number one, natural immunity. Um, why would you force a vaccine mandate on those with natural immunity? Um, number two, um, that the vax actually prevents infection or transmission. It doesn't. And so there's really no rationale for mandates when you know that. And lastly, vaccine injuries. I emailed that to you all. I'll email it again along with this court order so you'll have it. Thank you so much. Fire happened and uh, many trees lived, um, but they're being cut down by the pg &E plan to protect the power lines um, all along the, the line. And um, it, it's super distressing to know um, that we're doing like the most cost efficient, you know, approach to this rather than bearing the lines, you know, um, taking thoughtful, careful action. You know, we're an occupied land of Amamatsan tribal land. The place where we live is called Alinta. Um, people come from around the world to see this place. The trees should be memorialized. It should be a monument and protected as such and managed with care. Um, I do telehealth now because of the virus and I'm at home listening to the chipper going and the chainsaws going and um, it's extremely distressing to feel the trees falling. And um, I, I don't know what we're doing. It's not um, smart. It's asinine and careless and short-sighted. And uh, I emailed Ryan Coonerty. I was hoping to see his face here, not uh, nowhere. Uh, this is urgent because when a tree falls, you can't take it back. You can't, you don't get that back. So please, Please take some action on this. Uh, I understand it's sanctioned and blah, 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 but, um, and private land this and the ownership that, but you don't get the trees back. Thank you.
Uh, Gary Richard Arnold, uh, Chairman, Board of Supervisors. Um, the planning for this uh, COVID or forced vaccination has occurred a long time ago. In fact, it was uh, State Senator uh, Richard Pan and uh, Senate Bill uh, 277. In fact, the uh, uh, school employees union was up there pushing for it. A lot of people uh, that belong to these unions are never notified of what they're they're asking for. Uh, the uh, Senator Pan used to be a lobbyist before, before he became a senator. Um, we also have uh, ex uh, uh, supervisor uh, John Leopold, um, who was one of two people, one virtually isn't here, Mr. Zach's friend, uh, threatened both persons and property. Uh, we tried to get Sheriff uh, Hart to do a report on it. He did not. Instead, he endorsed uh, those two people that threatened. Uh, members of the uh, Grange and their property. Uh, Leopold also sent out an attack against his uh, 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 victor, uh, Manu, and uh, attacked him for having anti-vax support. It appears that uh, Leon Panetta and his whole machine could not prevent uh, a new supervisor from being replaced. And I think everybody should remember that. Um, in addition uh, to these forced vaccinations, you have Walmart, Eris, uh, working with the Democrats statewide. You've got uh, Charles Munger, who's also a Walmart uh, vice president, member of a secret society called Seven, involved with two presidential assassinations, working with Panetta. Uh, they, in fact, took over the local Republican Central Committee in the last elections. Uh, Leopold also worked for COPA, which is the Industrial Areas Foundation, uh, Rules for Radicals, you'd think that would be the last thing that Sheriff Hart would want to put his uh, crew under. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you in advance for your help on this. We There was an, a number of us in town here that met with representatives from Senator Laird and Mark Stone's offices, and we were requesting a town hall meeting um, to meet with these um, legislators, because there's a number of us in the community that are extremely concerned about the upcoming um, COVID vaccine mandates for school children. And while that's all kind of blurred and up in the air right now, what's going on, we do recognize that when the state legislature goes back in session <clears throat> in January, we want our representatives from these districts to go back to Sacramento, knowing exactly how their constituents feel about it. So we have asked their offices for a meeting for the community. We'd love an in-person town hall kind of something. Their offices are like, oh, we can't do that, COVID, et cetera. Um, but we, they need a chance to hear from the growing, growing numbers of very concerned parents and community members in Santa Cruz County they represent us, so we want them to go to Sacramento knowing exactly how we all feel. So I'm asking your assistance in reaching out to their offices. They have rather dismissed us and our request. You can email and call their offices all you want. We never know if that goes through. We are the, they are our elected representatives and we wanna see them face to face and tell them how we feel and how we want them to vote in Sacramento. So. If you all could please help us reach their offices and request that they get a meeting scheduled, I'd really appreciate that. Um, our voices are feeling thoroughly unheard here. I don't like that my elected representatives completely dismiss hundreds and hundreds and thousands of parents in the community. So I ask for your assistance in that and thank you so much. Thank you. Is there anybody else here who would like to address the board? We have anybody on the line? Call in user one, your microphone is available. As a reminder, it is star six to unmute. Hi, this is Marilyn Garrett. And is the other phone has to be hung up. Um, I um, also call for a halt to cutting the trees, which are the lungs of the earth. Stop murdering the trees. Something else that harms the trees is all the radiation from the cell towers and the white 
5G, et cetera, I call on the board to immediately halt installation of 5G and uh, to remove the existing sites. I have a question. Are we seeing COVID-19 symptoms or 5G radiation symptoms? A book that sheds light to answer that is The Contagion Myth by Thomas S. Cowan, M.D., and Sally Fallon Morell. The subtitle, Why Viruses, Including Coronavirus, Are Not the Cause of Disease. We are already familiar with millimeter wave technology. This is the frequency of airport scanners, which can see through your clothes. Children and pregnant women are not required to go through these scanners and nod to potential dangers. Adults get zapped a second or two. 5G bases in the same kind of radiation 24-7. A particular concern is the fact that some 5G transmitters broadcast at 60 gigahertz, a frequency that is absorbed by oxygen, causing the oxygen molecule composed of two oxygen atoms to split apart, making it useless for respiration. Illness has followed 5G installation in all major cities in America. We have 5G installations in our county. Halt this now. Emily Hansen, your microphone is available. Good morning, members of the board. This is Emily Hansen, and I represent Green Waste Recovery. Uh, this is regarding item number four, 43 on the consent agenda. We've been working on this item for more than a year, and the county is required to be compliant with Senate Bill um, SB 1383 starting January 1st. The amendment before you today has a number of items on it. Uh, first and foremost, the item to um, authorize us to proceed with offering expanded services starting January 1st that would bring the county into compliance with SB 1383. If this item is delayed until 12-7, the December 7th date, Green Waste Recovery will not have enough time to adequately notice your constituents of the rate increase. We will not have adequate time to enter in the rates uh, to be able to charge customers for the small increase associated with the provision of these services. Um, and we will be in a position where we cannot offer that SB 1383 compliance, therefore starting January 1st. This morning is the first that we've been notified that this item was going to be pulled. We respectfully ask for this item to uh, be pulled from the consent agenda, but heard today, please, and offer staff the opportunity to explain what exactly is wrong with the language. Um, HFH consultants is also available for discussion here today, but we've been working on the language for this amendment for over a year now, and um, there's really just no reason why this item needs to be pulled today. And it would be unfair to your constituents to have us proceed with a rate increase without adequate notice, um, and we won't have time to do that. So I respectfully request that you guys um, pull this item from the agenda, but have the item heard today. There's no reason that you cannot approve the amendment today with uh, final uh, language changes and authorize the CAO to sign so that we can proceed with SB 1383 compliance starting January 1st. Thank you. Caller 2915, your microphone is available. Hello. This is Becky Steinbrenner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I again want to follow up with the board on my concern that, as I understand it, none of the properties in the CZU fire area have been adjusted for the loss of the structures. The CZU, the CSA 48 special benefit assessment was passed based on benefit to those who would receive extra um, protection for their structures. Those in the CZU fire who lost their homes, everything, have no benefit from this tax, but are still being required to pay it, as I understand it, with no adjustment 
to their loss, and this must be addressed. There has been plenty of time for the assessor to work this out, and I ask your board to take emergency action to make an adjustment. I would like to speak to item consent agenda item number 35. I question why the planning department requires hiring an outside law firm to address legal issues in affordable housing, $125,000. And I, it is not clear to me why this has to be done. Is this related to the toxic land at uh, 1500 Capitola Road in Live Oak regarding that 57-unit affordable housing and Dientes and Medical Clinic. That, that, there's no remediation going on there. Nothing is being cleaned up. The, the toxic chemical is in the groundwater. That's been determined. We need to do a cleanup there. And I don't know if that's why this law firm is being hired to write deed restrictions so people can sign off and the county will not be liable. But I really question this. We've got a lot of attorneys in the county council's office taxpayers are paying for. Finally, now item, consent item 38, um, I see no money in the capital improvement project to rehabilitate and repair the incredible Burt Scott estate. That was a gift by Burt Scott's family, the head of Granite Construction, and that house is being left to ne be neglectfully disrepair, not being used, the roof Thank leaks, you. and it is Thank a you. disgrace. Thank, Thank you. you. Nila, your microphone is available. Hello. And um, I um, occasionally found on the agenda, it says that the, the Board of Supervisors has received the following items for correspondence which require no official action by the Board at this time. And it says that my letter from Ludmila Boyka is received and is not considered again to be discussed and or do something about that that I'm asking already for 10 years. So 10 years, I was trying to get um, the appointment with the previous uh, board of uh, supervisor, uh, John Leopold, and I was uh, unsuccessful to get a face-to-face -face appointment. And since January this year, I'm trying the same thing to get a face-to-face -face appointment with um, Manu Konik. I still didn't get it. And my issue about the human's life. So is it human's life cost nothing for that board of supervisors? that they do not wish to consider um, health and life as an emergency. And I never was allowed to get an appointment with the sheriff, um, also Jim Hart. And I was um, pushed away by Lieutenant Liberty first. And after that, uh, Lieutenant uh, Payne uh, threatened me to get arrested if I ever try again. I never was allowed to get an appointment with District Attorney Jeffrey Russell, or at least with his assistant. So this is just insane, the, how difficult to get an appointment with officials in Santa Cruz County. And also our court is in, not in compliance with the law. There is no rule of law considered by the court and the case get fabricated. So it is also a big issue that required attention, Board of Supervisors, please. Thank you. Call in user two, your microphone is available. Hello, Board of Supervisors and everybody listening. This is Diane Nichols. I'm calling because um, I want everybody in Santa Cruz County to be alert, to look around them outside their houses, look on top of the utility poles, at the very top of some utility poles in certain areas, such as on Seabright Avenue, such as on Freedom Boulevard, um, such as certain areas in Scotts Valley, including the main drag, there are little tiny brown transmitters. And it, just be alert. Those are the 4G and 5G transmitters. And if they're by your house, 
you will have an increased level of radiation uh, in your house. There's no doubt about that. I measure these with my meter regularly. And I want people to be alert. If they start getting symptoms, if you get symptoms of sleep problems, difficulty concentrating, um, fatigue, uh, even cancer down the line, call your supervisor. Let them know you're not happy with uh, this uh, installing these without your permission near your home. And despite the scientific evidence, um, June 1st, uh, uh, 2016 press release about major U.S. government study finds cell phone radiation causes cancer. This is about cell phones, but there's plenty about cell towers. I just happen to have this one here. Um, Na U.S. National Toxicology Program re review, review, released final peer-reviewed results of the $25 million study, dollar study on rats and cell phone radiation exposure. Um, they developed malignant brain tumors glioma or malignant heart tumors or precancerous lesions. This is just one study of thousands, thousands of studies. And just to let you know, the limits set by the FCC in 1996, a court, an appeals court has ruled that they have to rewrite them. They have never taken into account these thousands of studies for health effects, ever. And an appeals court has told Thank the FCC they now have to rewrite them. Thank you. Tracy Adams, your microphone is available. Hi, good morning, board. My name is Tracy Adams. I'm the chief executive officer of Green Waste Recovery. Um, I wanted to piggyback on Emily's comments. I'll be very quick here. Um, I was a little taken aback this morning to find that staff has pulled item 43 from the consent agenda. Um, and I would like to hope that we can work together in a meeting and put it on the regular agenda today so we can discuss what issues there might be so that we can move ahead and, and bring the county compliant with SB 1383 starting uh, January 1st. There's a number of pieces uh, of the proposal today uh, that I think we can discuss. And I'm hopeful that as a team, we can work forward and continue the partnership going forward. Uh, and I'll surrender the rest of my time. Thank you. There are no other speakers on Zoom. Okay, I did see some folks uh, come in later. Is there anybody that wanted to address this in oral communications? We will, uh, did you sure. want to, sir? Uh, can I address, because I can't stay here long, can I address the uh, cleanup on the fire? Yes, if you're not gonna be, uh, talk about it later, yes. Uh, yeah. Do you mind? No, Is please, you go ahead. Uh, that's that's uh, item number, what, eight? Eight, I believe. Yeah. Because yes. I'm Luke Rizzuto, I'm a 71 year uh, resident of this county. Uh, I'm working for a client at 340 Everest Drive, which is above the Boulder Creek Golf Course. She lost everything in the fire. And the cleanup was probably a good idea, but I don't think they had much supervision because they, they're gonna cost her probably $20,000 more because when they scraped the land, they took out her 125 foot septic outflow. They damaged her septic tank. They took out her septic pump, uh, expensive retaining walls. Um, I don't know what to do about it. I'm a contractor, been a contractor in this county for 45 years. Uh, I've been helping her out for free because she got insurance, but it's not gonna be enough to replace her house, I don't think. But I'm trying to pull all the favors I can for because I've been working for it for 12 years. So they did excessive damage. All the drain lines are gone. Uh, I have to go in and clean up the site. All the, the uh, uh, 50 foot long, eight foot wide uh, exposed aggregate walkway is gone and there was no need for it. There was nothing wrong with it. So uh, I don't know what we can do about it. I'm hoping you guys can do something about it. Uh, we put in a claim, it was denied. Um, I've got hours and hours of free hours for this lady. She's a real sweet lady. She has absolutely no family and she lost everything. So, uh, and I, uh, I've got some grudges against your planning department to begin with. You know, they've been hanging us out uh, quite a ways. I've been cooperating. I said, just let me know what to do and I'll do it for you. But Hate to tell you this, but your planning department's a joke throughout the nation. I'm I'm sorry, but I've been dealing with them for 45 years. And if you want to know skeletons in the closet, 
I know them, and my phone number is 408-590-2946 if you'd like to know skeletons in the closet dating back to 1976. Thank you. Uh, but anyway, if you could do something for this lady, she's a real, real sweet lady. Okay, and I can tell you, we will address this. It's, uh, um, it's a problem we're, we're concerned about. We're going to be talking about it later on item number eight. Can you give me a time, process time? Um, well, yeah, it'll be probably pretty soon because it's going to be the next... You will, uh, we'll have one item before that on the regular agenda than that one. So it might be at least a half an hour after we get to the regular agenda, but you wouldn't be able to speak again then, sir. Okay, okay. thank yeah. you very much. You're welcome. Um, anyone else, um, Chair McPherson, yes, uh, on item number 43, it, it, uh, it turns out that it will be problematic uh, to postpone it to the next meeting. There are some uh, final, uh, final issues we need to resolve on the contract. And so what I'd like to do is put it back on the agenda and uh, with the additional direction to direct uh, the CAO and the County Council to finalize and execute the contract, there's just some minor adjustments that still need to be made, but it is time sensitive. And so uh, I don't know if you wanna leave it on consent with that additional direction or else we can move it to regular. I, I think, um, did you, um, does it need further explanation of what, what adjustments are gonna be made? Do you think the, what, what the County Council should no, I don't think it needs um, that explanation, okay. but I just want to make sure that um, the staff recommendation for that action is 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 not um, accepted uh, because there's a draft contract that's on the agenda right now. Okay. And so what what you would be doing is is giving staff direction, the CIO's office and county council to authority to revise that, make final revisions to the version that's online right now and then execute that. Okay, yeah, that seems to be the best process, uh, procedure to uh, follow right now. Okay, we will put item 43 with that direction uh, back on the consent agenda. Uh, any other com comments from the board? No, okay. Um, consent, uh, discussion on the consent items uh, from the board, uh, Mr. Koenig. Thank you, Chair. On item 34, approving Prop 68 grant applications. I want to thank the Parks Department for preparing these grant applications, uh, but also uh, which, which do include uh, applications for the Simpkins Family Swim Center, Indoor Youth Activity Center, and Outdoor Learning Center, Chanticleer Park Phase 2, South County Parkland Acquisition, and North Coast Rail Trail Phase 2. Uh, I did also want to use the opportunity to say I hear a lot from constituents who are concerned about the state of our parks and a lot of the deferred maintenance. And so uh, I would urge the Parks Department to work with the Parks Commission uh, to propose a budget that's going to work and help address much of this deferred maintenance for next year. And also um, just point out to this board that if we're going to continue to acquire parkland uh, and build more parks, we'd better identify the budget to maintain them. On item 36, the Unified Permit Center uh, request for additional staff. I'm fully in support of the additional staff. Uh, this, the permit center will help address some of the shortcomings of our planning department and put a persistent focus on the customer experience and tracking performance metrics to determine operational success. I think that's essential. Uh, and I'm glad to hear that a focus group was held with local architects, engineers, planning consultants, and designers. And I'm happy that we are dedicating more staff time to this. A uh, full-time senior lead and at least half-time planner will be are, are much needed. And finally, on item 43, I'm glad we can move forward with this in some form today. Uh, the uh, amended franchise agreement is essential to allowing us to begin a composting program as required under state law next year. And I'm um, glad we'll be able to, uh, with a little last minute work, meet the deadlines necessary. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Friend, any comments on consent? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. So I'll just speak briefly on a couple of items. First, just an appreciation in general to public works. There's a couple items on here in regards to the CIP and storm damage updates, just uh, compliments on the continued improvement on the CIP. It really, uh, each year just seems to get better with the quality of, of it. And I, uh, for those in the community that uh, look for the ways that, that we help uh, prioritize our funding in regards to those capital improvement uh, programs and projects, just take a look at the CIP. And I know that we have a study session in December, but I just wanted to compliment them on the work that they do to make it so easy to use and read. Um, a, a brief, uh, moment of appreciation on item 45 as well, which is something that I know that uh, Steve Wiesner worked on pretty closely uh, in my district, which is to, it just is listed here as a Pinehurst and Greenbrier pedestrian improvements, but it really is, is a pretty significant improvement around Rio Del Mar Elementary for both ADA access and pedestrian improvements and long overdue. 
Uh, we have a great partnership with PVUSD on this. I, I had the opportunity to speak to uh, Trustee Jen Holm, who wanted to express her appreciation to Mr. Wiesner and the county for moving forward on this. Um, this will really greatly improve pedestrian safety in and around Rio de Moore Elementary. There's a lot of kids that walk through there, uh, through the neighborhood. So a lot of appreciation for both the school district's partnership and in particular, Steve Wiesner's work on this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. All right, Mr. Chair, uh, I have no comments today. I appreciate all the work that's being done uh, in these challenging times. Thank you. Supervisor Caput, any comments on the consent agenda? Uh, thank you. Uh, just a uh, comment on uh, item number 34. It's uh, good to see uh, South County looking uh, for park uh, acquisition, parkland acquisition. And uh, it's, uh, it's something that should have been done, you know, years and years ago. But uh, anyway, uh, number 34 is a good thing for uh, South County. Thank you. That's it. Okay. Uh, I, I, on item number 26, the Watsonville Hospital, I want to thank our CEO, uh, Carlos Palacios, our former health services director, Mimi Hall and partners uh, at the uh, Pajaro Valley Healthcare District. This project is critically important to the county, uh, especially the South County. And uh, because of its impact on healthcare uh, for some of our most vulnerable residents. And thank you for that effort to try to put that, to pull that together. Item 33 is housing matters and downtown streets. And I'm pleased to that we were able to work with housing matters and the downtown streets team on addressing homelessness. Uh, these two agencies are very effective partners because they meet people where they are and offer them opportunities to take steps toward finding housing, employment, and other aspects of uh, life that uh, hopefully will end the, their homelessness. Uh, housing matters and downtown streets team have been very, very important to the county for addressing this, helping us address this issue. Uh, item number 36, it has been mentioned, the Use Permits, uh, United Permits Center, uh, pulling together uh, that center has been one of our most important strategic objectives for several years. Uh, the community really needs to have a forward-looking predictable process in terms of a time frame and money. And as one spokesperson already said, our planning department could use some improvement in that area. They realize that along with uh, public works and it's going to be uh, very nice for the, 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 the customer service lessons that we have learned from the fire uh, recovery permit center will be folded into the center's operations, which will really improve the customer experience, hopefully to get a, a, a more, a, a, um, a more timely uh, response to their needs. And I look forward to seeing that center uh, become a reality the next year. And I think thank the CAO and all the departments and the staff that who've been involved in that. And finally, on uh, item number uh, 42 has been mentioned, the winter storm repairs. An enormous thank you to the Department of Public Works for its dedicated work in repairing those damaged roads from the 2016 and 17 storms. Considering the, the scope of that damage, um, it was $56 million. And this work has taken a, 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 a tremendous amount of uh, time for us to get across the uh, finish line. The, the damage as mentioned in the years, um, is five years ago when we've completed 43% of those projects uh, with the rest in progress, and which is a real testament and, uh, to the perseverance of our public works department and uh, staff. They're really to be uh, complimented because they've really worked uh, hard and it's required a tremendous amount of work to manage the reimbursement process with the Federal Emergency Management Agency or FEMA and the Federal Highway uh, Highways Agency. It takes a lot of time to get through this process and they've done an excellent job of getting this as quickly as we can. It's, it is a long time, but we have done, done an outstanding job compared to the other counties in the state. Um, and with that, I it would uh, entertain a motion for uh, approving the consent agenda as a, amended. Mr. Chair, I'll move the consent agenda with the amended direction on item 43. Second. Please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Thank you. Motion with additional direction passes unanimously. Thank you.
Okay, we will go to the regular agenda now, item number seven, uh, consider the adoption of an ordinance to amend the Santa Cruz County Code Chapter 2.98.040, Section D, increasing the compensation for members of the Assessment Appeals Board as outlined in the memorandum of the County Administrative Officer. There's a Assessors and Appeals Board's Benefits Survey, an ordinance, and uh, Santa Cruz County Section 2.9804, strike out and underline with that. Thank you. Please. Good morning, members of the board. This item is a request to increase the compensation for members of the Assessment Appeals Board from $75 per meeting to $200 per meeting by amending Santa Cruz County Code, Chapter 2.98.040, Section D. Per the information contained in the board memo, we have found it increasingly difficult to recruit and retain members for this body, and we have not had alternate members in several years. Currently, the compensation paid is one of the lowest of all the counties, and we are hopeful that an increase in compensation will help to attract new members and alternates for the recruitment that is currently in process. The current cost for the three-member panel at $75 per meeting for eight meetings per year is $1,800, and with the increase, the cost would be $4,800. Sufficient funds exist within the current year budget to cover the increased cost for the remainder of fiscal year 2021. Therefore, we request that you move and approve the recommended actions, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Um, any questions from the board? No, Mr. Chair, this is a very reasonable uh, request, and uh, I know that they've had a very difficult time retaining. It's also a very important uh, body that we have, and so I think that it's a, this is a very reasonable request to do this. Uh, we should also, in general, actually look toward um, on all of our commissions, whether there, there needs to be any adjustments and, and also build in any sort of escalators that may be necessary moving forward. It's been so long since we've um, done amendments to some of these groups, including the Planning Commission, that it may make sense to look forward in that. But but for now, this this right here is a very reasonable request. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Koenig. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just curious what the typical volume of, of cases that the Assessment Appeals Board has to hear um, so this year's course has been a little unusual because of the fire. So they've had a, a number of cases. On any given meeting, there could be 10 to 12 cases. Um, and sometimes there's more than that. Hmm. And I was also just curious, uh, looking at the benefits survey, uh, many counties chose to do a half day and a full day rate. Is there a reason why we chose to just do uh, one flat rate? Uh, yes, because typically our meetings go all day. So we, uh, just looking at the historical way that the meetings have gone, we didn't go to a half day rate. Okay, thank you. Uh, any comments from Supervisor Kapp? It's okay. Supervisor okay. Cooney, any comments? Thank you. Oh, just a thank you from Supervisor Caput. Any comments, Supervisor Coonerty? No, I, I agree with the staff recommendation. Any comments from the public? You do have one. Sure. They've lowered their hand, so there are no. There they okay. are. Okay. Uh, bring back caller two nine one five. Your microphone is available. Apologies, Chair. Hello, this is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. I um, appreciate the work that all commissioners do within our county. I really question this one because in the past, the county had an agreement with an attorney that was well-versed in real estate law. And I think that is the more appropriate action. Right now, one of the um, commissioners, I believe, is Steve Allen a property manager, what, um, what qualifications does this, board, this commission require? I think that we should go back to having a contract with um, a real estate attorney because that's what these issues are. And it would better serve the public. I have been to some of these assessment appeals um, meetings and there were only one or two people there. As staff said, this is an unusual year because of the fire. But going forward, that will hopefully calm down. And this will be an, an extraordinary expense to the public and maybe not serving the public in the best capacity for what is being brought before the commission. So I am opposed to this, and I think this commission in particular, the board, should consist, again, of a real estate attorney. 
and that the county should go back to contracting with that. Thank you. There are no other speakers. Okay, no other comments from the public here. Uh, entertain a motion. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Oh, second. Only uh, Caput, please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Nice. We'll move on to item number eight to consider a report on the CZU uh, August Lightning Complex Fire State Debris Removal Operations Road Damage to the County Maintain and Private Roads and take related actions that are outlined in the memorandum of the Director of the Office of Response, Recovery and Resilience. Uh, we have uh, Cal OES uh, Office of Emergency Services Access Road Maintenance uh, Report. Um, we have uh, County of Santa Cruz Fire De Debris Removal Report, CZU Fire Road damage request of the county and a, and a FEMA appeals of de decision. I believe our public works director, uh, Matt Machado and uh, our office of recovery resilience, uh, Dave Reed, are going to comment on this. Thank you, chair, board. Good morning. Um, yeah, we want deputy director uh, or deputy CAO, um, Matt Machado and I wanted to share a little bit more information with all of you regarding uh, the debris removal operations today uh, to bring you up to speed on, on the efforts that we've been making on behalf of the county, as well as the community um, that we may hear from as well regarding the damage done during the debris removal operations. Next slide. So we wanted to just review and update everybody on the debris removal scope of operations today. Um, talk a little bit about the contract details. Um, it's often referred to as a Cal OES contract. It's actually a contract that Cal Recycle had with the debris removal contractor. We want to talk a little bit about the correspondence that transpired throughout the debris removal schedule and operations. And then um, we're going to discuss in, in some specifics the road damage that was, has occurred on our county maintained road network as well as on private roads, driveways, and property throughout the CZU burn area. Next slide, please. This slide is a, 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 an image showing the Cal OES debris removal dashboard, just to give you a context for how many properties in Santa Cruz County had damage removed. Um, this number reflects both private property and state park property, but over 683 um, properties, 740 in total, when you factor in hazardous trees, um, were, uh, were worked on throughout the county. So a significant number of, of truck loads and debris removed um, throughout our county. Next slide, please. This slide I wanted to show um, and, and share that we, we, in addition to the public option that, that worked on a number of properties throughout the CZU burn area, um, Marilyn Underwood and her team um, managed uh, over 200 private property debris removal operations. And without, um, without exception, we have not heard of or, ex or her, uh, had complaints regarding the operations by private contractors generally speaking, because they were able to take a little bit more time. They were to use the appropriate size and scaled equipment, and they were working more closely with property owners to um, manage the, the critical hazardous debris removal, but to do so in a more sensitive uh, site-specific manner. Next slide, please. This graph um, shows the timing of the debris removal. And, uh, and this is significant for a couple of reasons. So the blue bars represent the public option debris removal timeline. And you can see that in earnest, it started in February um, with the most of the debris removal happening in April, May, and June. So we were well outside of our rainy season um, by the time most of the debris removal operations were occurring. So there was ample opportunity to use best management practices regarding um, dust uh, management and road management during the debris removal operations. The other reason this will become significant, I'll share later, but just to, just to reiterate um, that between February and July, most of the debris was removed throughout the county. Next slide, please. So some specifics on the Anvil contract for folks. This was a, a Cal Recycle contract. As I said, the low bid uh, was awarded to Anvil Builders Inc. for approximately $225 million. 
for the debris removal in the Bay Branch region. So that Bay Branch region included more than just Santa Cruz County, but at the time of the preparation for this um, contract, it was estimated that about 1,200 properties would be scheduled for debris removal. We have over 50% of the properties that were, were managed by Anvil. So a significant number of properties uh, for this contract. And as you can see, based on that dollar amount, a significant amount of money um, was contracted to remove debris in Santa Cruz County. The other point I want to make just briefly is that WSP was the management team selected by Cal Recycle. And in general, um, my experience both with Cal OES and Cal Recycle and WSP during the debris removal process was great. They worked hard to answer our emails, questions. We had numerous meetings, weekly conversations. We met with Deputy Director Burris on two different occasions, the Deputy Director of Cal OES on two different occasions, one around the hazardous tree removal process in early March, and we met again to discuss the road damage that was occurring. Um, so during the process, things with, with all parties, what, the communication was good, but what, has, what we have come to realize through a lot of efforts by private property owners as well as Matt, is that it's been harder to get them to come to the table um, to address the issues that we're talking about today. Next slide, please. Um, this is a, an attachment in the packet. The reason I just wanted to highlight this for everybody is that back in February, February 26, 2021, many of the residents sitting behind me that live on last chance raised this issue and the concerns that we're talking about today around road damage they were concerned about the grading that was being done to their roads to make them safer for debris removal. And Cal Recycle, Cal OS issued this statement. It's an attached in the, in the agenda item. And I highlight the box below um, on this first page, which outlines that the roads will be returned to condition they were in before commencement of debris removal. Returned road conditions may be different, but equal to or better than the condition prior to commencement of the debris removal operations. This was their language. This was their document provided in February before most of the work had begun, but they had done the preparate, they'd begun the preparations to do debris removal and it was already clearly a concern for many residents in our county. Next slide, please. Now I'm gonna hand off to um, Matt Machado and uh, he'll bring you guys up to speed on the county maintained roads and private road damage work. All right, thank you, Dave, and uh, good morning, Chair and Supervisors. Um, we have 45 miles of roads within the CZU burn area, uh, plus many more miles of private roads. But the common thing is that all of these roads serve our community equally, so they're all very important to us. We did sustain uh, a lot of damage from the CZU fire. Next slide, please. You can see that we lost many signs, many culverts, uh, we actually even had uh, four retaining walls damaged and burned. We lost a bridge. We had significant damage to another bridge. We lost about 4,000 feet of guardrail. We sustained damage. We know damage. Um, we had to remove about 9,000 trees that threatened our road system. In total, we had more than $10 million of damage. Uh, we do expect about 80% reimbursement from FEMA on all this damage. Next slide. But what we didn't expect was all of the roadway damage from debris removal operations and the Anvil contractor. In our county, we generally have two types of roads. We have major collectors and minor collectors. The minor collectors are considered our local roads and they fall under Cal OES and FEMA jurisdiction for emergency operations. Those are the subject of this slide. We have 17 county maintained roads that received significant damage directly from Anvil contractor. Uh, and those roads are, are minor roads or local roads. They do not normally see heavy traffic and they were not managed well. And so we sustained significant damage. Next slide, please. You can see this is a, a detailed list of the damage we sustained on those 17 roads. Uh, we value it at about $4.4 .4 million. We did alert Cal OES and FEMA in April of this past year of that damage. Um, we filed a claim, that claim was denied. We filed an appeal in August and we expect that to be done, denied based upon FEMA staff uh, explaining to us that this damage is a 
direct result of a state contractor. And so it's not eligible for FEMA reimbursement. Uh, next slide, please. What we also understand is that that state contract with the Anvil Builders uh, did include repair and maintenance provisions so that uh, our road system would be protected both our public road and our private road system. You can see on this slide uh, some details of the damage that we sustained. On the county roads, uh, we have about $4.4 million of damage. And then on uh, some of the larger private road damage includes last chance, uh, nearly eight miles of roadway that was damaged at almost $3 million, $2.7 million of damage. And then uh, even some of our CSA sustained damage and they have filed claims. Uh, they are eligible for FEMA reimbursement, but they've been denied as well for the same reasons that our county roads were denied. And then 71 uh, proper, private property owner claims that were uh, denied. Throughout the summer, we were assured by Cal OES that we would get this resolved through the Anvil contract. Here we are in the, in the near winter and uh, the resolution has not occurred. And so we are here today, um, next slide, because we believe that continued advocacy will be critical to reach resolution on all of this damage. Next slide. So the recommended action today is to accept and file a summary report of road damage on county maintained roads and private roads due to the Cal OES managed CZU fire debris removal operation and to direct County Office of Response, Recovery and Resilience and the Department of Public Works to work with a delegation of state and federal elected officials to meet with state officials regarding the damage incurred during the debris removal operations and advocate for our residents damage caused during the debris removal operations. And we can answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you for that uh, depressive Pressing report. I'd, I'd like to make a couple comments first. Uh, quite clearly, the county can't bear the expense of repairing these roads uh, and or pass it along to our residents. And we really can't allow them to, to main, remain in the condition. They're just going to get worse and cost more. Um, I would like to uh, provide additional direction to this item to direct the chair to write a letter directly to Gavin Newsom, Governor Newsom. Uh, pleading our case uh, for the state and federal intervention repairing of the roads. Cal OES is under his administration, but I think we need his leadership on this. And if we go directly to that office, I think it'd be beneficial. Uh, my, my office has been informed the fire victims that have been uh, damaged, of the roads damaged by Anvil will not be allowed to apply for building permits until they receive fire clearance, which will not be granted until the road is repaired. Um, and this, if, is this the case? And if so, um, how are the fire victims on Anvil uh, damaged roads going to proceed when Anvil is taking the re no responsibility for damage? Um, and the negotiations with them may take months, if not years. Um, that's, I think, the concern we're going to hear here uh, today. But uh, can you answer? I, I will share a bit about the last chance community because I know they had that situation, but I also know that they've invested a lot of their own resources to get those roads in some kind of condition so that they can start the rebuild process. They've invested heavily themselves. And so currently the burden is on them. Um, I will share that they've been um, working very hard, very diligently, and they have made some improvements. Uh, the past couple of storms, they've suffered significantly with people being stuck or trapped in their in their sites um, but i do know they're making headway so i think a lot of our advocacy will be an after the fact to help uh, restore their roads to to their former condition um, independent of the homeowners investing them their own resources so that they can start the rebuild process i mean i'd let them comment further but um, i do know and i am aware of some of those efforts Any other comments from the board? Uh, Supervisor Coonerty? Yeah, Mr. Chair, I just want to, I mean, I want to take a moment to first thank staff because while we've been trying to respond to the largest natural disaster in the county's history um, and the, the, 
the building and rebuilding needs to be done. Our staff has also been put in the position of having to be advocates and uh, intermediaries between uh, between community residents and these agencies and companies that that are not as responsive as we need them to be. And um, you know, it's it's as people have experienced trauma. Uh, of losing their homes and their communities and everything else um, to have to battle companies that got large contracts for a job to do that we expected them to do well. And, you know, we expect anyone who has a public contract to do the job well, but when it's uh, disaster recovery and people's lives, lives and livelihoods are at stake, um, we expect them to do better than well. We expect them to live up to, to, to the full contract and to serve you know, be part of the public service uh, in a response to a natural disaster. And um, I appreciate this effort and I'm hopeful that uh, by sort of moving this up the chain and creating an awareness and political pressure, we can get a better response than we've gotten now. The people, uh, this has happened across the fire scar, but the people of last chance have been um, in an impossible position of trying to access their community after damage was done by Anvil and then not repaired and then sort of forced into these uh, pressure filled uh, releases of liability. And it's, it's, it's not a good situation. It's not how uh, companies should operate. And I hope we can get um, a better response uh, after this effort. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from the board? I know we have some folks here that want to speak to this. No, I'll just say oh, thank you uh, for the report. And uh, I guess uh, with the rains last year, uh, in, uh, it could have been a lot worse, of course, the damage. Uh, but uh, this year, we look like we're, we're OK, I guess, huh? Well, we were fortunate to, to miss any debris flow. So in that sense, uh, we dodged that one for now. Um, but the past two storms have created a fair amount of problem for some of these communities. Um, I mentioned a few minutes ago that uh, we have heard of people being trapped at their home sites because the road damage was so great that they couldn't get out uh, through the mud and debris that was left behind. And so I don't think we're out of the woods in that right. regard, um, but they are doing some improvement. So, you know, it, it's a battle right now. They're in the middle of a battle. Would you say the uh, the rain uh, storm we had about uh, two weeks ago uh, in the long run that helped us or does that hurt us? Well, I think, you know, rain is a double edged sword. It certainly helped our drought condition and, you know, suppress any fire risk. But um, with road damage, uh, that damage will get worse with rain. Uh, rain is the number one enemy of roads or roads is number one anyways. They don't go well together. Yeah, right. And so we have that continued situation. So it's kind of a blessing and a, and a bit of a curse for, for this situation. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments uh, uh, for the public? Uh, how many would like to speak on this? Okay, please. Uh, we have two minutes. Hello. Thank you for uh, having this item on the agenda for today. I appreciate it. My name is Susie Devergran. I live at the end of Last Chance Road, um, and I appreciate the efforts on our behalf that have been that have happened so far. I want to explain that Last Chance Road has one mile at the front that's paved, and then the rest is all dirt. I approximate that it's around 25 miles worth of the main road and then seven spur roads, as well as driveways. And all of those road surfaces were accessed by Anvil in the debris removal process. So they've been, all been impacted. Um, we have a road association since 1972. Oh, sorry. I thought that was what you wanted me to do. <laughs> okay, sure. um, we have a road association since 1972 and we have elected positions. We have a road manager and um, we have maintained the road for decades in very good condition. Over the years, we've put gravel on it and that's kept the road in good shape. That gravel was all removed by Anvil when they came and resurfaced the road. Um, I've been driving on the road for 22 years commuting, and so I've been able to see what condition it's in. And I was living at the mill site where it's at the end of Last Chance Road during the debris removal process. So I was right there with all the big trucks coming and going and was able to see the changes in the road as it happened. They use these big articulated trucks called haulers in some of the harder to access areas. And those are the areas that really got chewed up um, because 
those types of vehicles did a lot of damage to the roads. They created this, what we call moon dust. It was like a foot deep of this fine, almost like talcum powder um, dust that's been very hard to deal with and has created problems with the roads since then with the recent rains. Um, I had expressed some concern at the time when I was there about the condition of the road and talked to Misty who worked for WSP and she contacted the people with Anvil and they assured us that they would pave this front section after the last truck went out and they would leave us with gravel. Unfortunately, they did not follow through on those, um, on those promises. So I appreciate your support on our behalf and look forward to hearing the results. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Jim McCarthy. I live on uh, Alba Road and Ben Lomond. And uh, first I wanna say, I uh, appreciate all the work that all of the supervisors do, all the elected officials do. Um, so we don't have to. But one of the things that bothers me is I've lived up there for uh, 39 years, not a lot compared to some, but enough. And I remember when I moved there, I could damn near lay on Alba Road and get a suntan without any vehicles driving by. Now, <clears throat> I know, but I can't do that now. Uh, the population of San Lorenzo Valley has uh, increased tremendously, but I don't think the money that's being spent by the county uh, to take care of the San Lorenzo Valley and Alba Road and some of the other roads that are up in the mountains is, um, as, is, is given as equitably to Alba and those roads, Jamison Creek and so on, as the money that's being spent on um, Pine Flat, for example. Now, I don't know how many of you live on Pine Flat. A lot of the university people, I guess, do. But that always seems to be in great shape. I mean, perfect. Um, <clears throat> Alba gets, uh, pardon the word, uh, sucks high and tit. And a lot of the damage that we're seeing now was started long before Anvil ever came. Anvil made it horribly worse. We have a couple of slide outs that they're working on. One's done, one's being worked on. Another one hasn't even started where the whole road, half of it's cracked and it's gonna go away and you, you won't be able to get one lane up and down. That's uh, where all the turns are, about a half a mile, three quarters of a mile up Alper from Highway 9. Anyhow, I'm done, sorry. I'd, all right, thank you. Hi, um, I live uh, or used to live in the Riverside Grove community off of Pinecrest Road, which is a CSA. But below us, um, the streets leading up to that are county roads. And those roads had actually been repaved not too many years ago and were in fantastic shape before Anvil came in. And actually on the slide, you showed that the most of the cleanup was done after January, but in our neighborhood, the cleanup started in January. And in late January, we had that significant rainstorm. And it was after that, that I started seeing damage. And I applied for um, a damage claim and Calvert Seifel rejected it because they said I signed the uh, right of entry. But not all of my neighbors uh, lost their homes inside the right, right of entry. Um, so Anvil damaged their road too. And I took, uh, sent in 60 photos uh, showing the damage. And the damage is now getting worse and worse now that we've had some more rains. And I'm thinking it won't be too long before emergency vehicles won't be able to get up there to those three surviving homes. And I don't know what um, the state is gonna do to address this. Um, and I know Matt you know, has documented this well, but we need, we need to put pressure on the state. They need to, um, they, we can't afford this right now. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hi, my name is Valerie Brown with United Policyholders. I'm the chair of the Santa Cruz County Long-Term Recovery Group. And I'd like to just echo what uh, Supervisor McPherson mentioned and that the, the impact of not getting this resolved is gonna put people in a situation where they cannot rebuild. Um, if they can't get access to the site, they can't get a clearance, this isn't, you're, you're gonna lose so much of your population that's impacted. And that is key to recognize that there needs to be some, be some accommodation there, but also pushing on this uh, level very hard. Um, in, in including Cal Recycles and the Water Board because that recycling program for the state is a complicated system with multiple players. Put them all on notice because they owe you what they promised you, which is they were going to take care of this damage. 
Um, and we're working on behalf of the, the hundreds of people who lost their homes and there's, they don't have the resources to do this. You are their hope to make this happen. Thank you. My name is Roger Wapner. We have five acres up in Boulder Creek past the golf course. And uh, we remodeled in 2010 to a 3000 square foot house, a 13 car garage, it's all gone from the fire. I have a somewhat related but different type of testimony where I was present for the three days of uh, debris removal anvil uh, performed and they did a pretty good job. Uh, and they uh, authorized and left um, uh, personal property and also uh, the rebar that was attached to our 69 pylons uh, for rebuilding the home. In, uh, I was also present for the uh, uh, soils and for the spraying erosion control. I was on site, I saw it happen. Everybody did great. Then sometime in April, May, Anvil came back and uh, they destroyed uh, a culvert and I complained <laughs> about it. So this is how it ties into the road damage. Uh, I believe they retaliated by coming back after I made the complaint about the uh, culvert damage, which really wasn't a big deal, but it was so sloppy. Uh, I had uh, um, managed uh, commercial drivers in the past and denying attention. And uh, the uh, result was that all the rebar on my 69 pylons was cut, removed, and my personal, uh, personal property was also removed from my property. I've uh, put a claim in, uh, it has not been acknowledged. Uh, so I am hoping that uh, I can be tied in with the rest of the uh, actions going to the state. And I really appreciate your support. We were underinsured and this would be a tremendous help. Thank you very much. Thank you for everything you've done up there too. Thank you. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Forrest Martinez McKinney. I'm a lifelong resident of Last Chance Road. Um, I'd like to thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak. Um, <clears throat> our community has been failed in many ways over the decades. And, um, you know, be it the, the park closing our escape route or Cal Fire's very slow evacuation order, which um, we know resulted in the death of one of our community members. Um, well, I've come here today to ask you to help us in holding Anvil to, count, uh, to account to address the things that they failed us on. First and foremost is the repaving of the first mile of our road. They could probably get away with half of it. They could have probably gotten away with very little, but they made no effort at all. And so we're here today wasting all of our time trying to find a resolution. Um, our community is probably, you know, one of the more resilient communities in this county because of these failings of both government and uh, public agencies over the years. And we're stronger for it. We will continue to be there and we will continue to make our homes there, but we do request your help. And we are very grateful for the um, efforts that you've made since the CZU fire to help us Return to our homes. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. <clears throat> I'm Stephen Barnes. I'm the Last Chance Road Manager. I'm responsible for the upkeep and maintenance of Last Chance Road. I hold an LTO license and many years experience in road building and maintenance. You might get a little closer to the mic, please. Thank you. I'm gonna start from the beginning. Um, Anvil's road person, I met uh, I met with Anvil's road person, Eric, and several other Anvil people before the cleanup and last chance. Eric insisted he was going to bulldoze and use a grader on last chance road. I told him, to, he said he's gonna make the road flat and a flat road does not drain water. Because we were disagreeing on how the road should be done, Eric promised me 40 loads of rock to reshape the road when Anvil was finished. 
This was stated in front of Scott of Cal Fire OES. So they came in, they scraped 35 years of rock off the road and took out all the culverts and a couple and, and the bleed outs. Throughout the cleanup process, they kept telling me rock was coming and they were going to replace the culverts. When the cleanup was done, Anvil packed up and left and they left the, the front 1.5 miles of pavement completely crushed and ruined. Their contract stated they were supposed to leave the road as same or better condition. Uh, I've been working the road since they left and I've never worked in such bad conditions. The spur roads to all the residents' houses were over a foot of dust. Once the rain came, I did what I could to get the water off the road. Um, it was so bad when I was working Pine Mountain, the rain came, my work truck got stuck. Uh, so I abandoned it, walked home, came back a couple days later, and there was a redwood branch come through the windshield. Uh, I'm doing all that I can to bring the road back to pre-Anvil condition. Anvil knows they left a mess and offered us $75,000 when we had engineers come in and estimate $2.7 million to repair. And that's all. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry about that. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Leslie Keedy, and I am the sole uh, person that um, had a home on Upper Bloom Grade, which is the historic road that used to take people to Big Basin State Park. Um, the county abandoned Bloom Grade and the section of Bloom Grade that comes off of Little Basin, I've been maintaining personally as a single female for 15 years, and it cost me a lot of money to do that. Um, the Anvil Cruise, um, I was encouraged to go the public direction when we went to the shelter to discuss that. Uh, so I went with that and I did sign the right of entry form. And on that right of entry, of course, it stated that I would accept damage. I would have to commend Anvil for meeting with me and giving me personalized attention um, about crossing the road. And um, however, um, when they brought in the second piece of equipment, which was a huge excavator to demo my foundation, um, since they didn't have attachments uh, for one machine, they had to bring in a second machine. When they brought in that second machine, they ruined a section that I had just spent about $20,000 overlaying where there was a slide. So that was damaged. And um, then I submitted the claim uh, when I saw that information from you folks about claiming for damage. That was very encouraging. But then, of course, I was denied that. So the county has abandoned this road. All repairs are on me. Um, when the PG&E crews came in to do all the tree removal for my tap line, I sustained a huge amount of damage. Then the rain came and I had major issues with erosion. Fortunately, Pacific Gas and Electric was very honorable and they paid out a claim which helped facilitate some of the repairs. Um, I have, um, as a single gal, just spent about $30,000 repairing this section of upper bloom grade so I could actually get fire clearance on my pre-application. So um, any um, assistance that I could get to help repair this because now I'm looking at another 15 grand out of pocket to do repairs on the anvil section. Um, so pg &E did a great job. Anvil tried to do a great job, but they had uh, too big of equipment and um, they uh, ended up causing me some damage. Um, so um, doing the best we can out there, but any help you can give us uh, surviving victims <laughs> would be appreciated. Thank you so much. And first of all, uh, Mr. Caput, Supervisor Caput, uh, we did see some, a little bit less dust from the rains, uh, but it increased the amount of washboarding on the roads. So it didn't really help that much. Um, if you don't get anything else from my testimony, I want you to remember one thing. Anvil was simply the fox guarding the hen house. The state didn't do its job. And that's the problem. It's, you know, Anvil is a for-profit corporation. I don't really like them, but I don't blame them. But there was no supervision on them. Okay. Um, the summary and analysis that you have in your packet is accurate. It's very good. And I hope that you take a good look at it. I hope also that you take a look at our engineers reports that we hired to make sure that we weren't blowing hot air on this whole issue. So we knew what we were talking about. When we asked um, we asked the state simply that they fulfill the conditions to their mitigation measures, 
that they that we be allowed to be part of the scope of work for fixing the roads. And third, that they withhold a final payment until this item was concluded. Uh, but there wasn't any supervision of Anvil as far as the roads. They did a fair job as far as cleaning up the properties. Some people had problems, of course, but I think that was where their supervision was. The project manager um, actually on his business card was a tire remediation specialist. So that was Cal Recycles project manager. So as I was complaining, starting in April, speaking to Jason Heath and David and, and Matt and everybody else I could talk to, um, they weren't hearing us. I called the director of Cal OES and complained, told him that he had a supervision problem that was easy to fix. I heard from his people that night and within two weeks they were transferred. So after that, we didn't really get anything. Um, this, the discussions your, with Cal OES. Could you summarize your comments, please? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. The discussions with Cal OES uh, revealed that uh, this was the first contract that where the, the contractor was responsible for the roads. It was uh, the, the ROE, the right of entry, was in conflict with the contract. And thirdly, the state did not want to set a precedent of, of forcing the contractor to adhere to the mitigation measures. So basically, that's it. Good morning, Chair McPherson, District Supervisors. My name is Olma O'Neill. I'm here to read a message on behalf of the White House Canyon Improvement Association President, Julia Rivera. I live in White House Canyon. When Anvil started the debris removal on our road, they graded the road flat and removed about six to eight inches of material. That top six inches took about 30 years of work and rock to get to a place where we had a seal. The grading cracked that seal and removed hundreds of thousands of dollars of rock and work. Also, by bringing the road down six inches, the existing drainages were no longer functional. The portion of our road with this type of damage is primarily on state park property. After the debris removal, Anvil put about two inches of base on the road and called it good. The state park also signed off on the work and said they did a great job. Even Cal OES said the road looked great. Putting two inches of base rock may have looked nice, but is not functional. The first couple of rains proved it and the base turned to mud. We were supposed to have our road returned to its original state. We are far from it. Our road is maintained by the landowners, even though it is a public road used by the state park, who has never contributed anything in the past 30 years. The first portion is state park and the last portion is CSA number 18. We as landowners do not have enough money to return the road to its original shape. It will take us decades with the budget we have. This message continues with the next speaker. Thank you, sir, ma'am. Morning, Chair McPherson and District Supervisors. Uh, my name is Rory O'Neill and I'm also from White House Canyon Community. I'm here to continue reading a message on behalf of our Neighborhood Association President, Julia Rivera. Anvil rolled a 10-wheeler dump truck into White House Creek and removed about two to three feet of road when they removed the truck from the creek. The instigating factor that led to this accident was Anvil's original mistake of grading the road flat and down too far. When they did that in this section of road, they buried a culvert that drained a natural spring. I told workers for over a week about this and that the road was getting more and more sloppy each day and they needed to unplug the culvert. They never made a single attempt to mitigate the hazard they created and risk the lives of the truck drivers, the residents and the public driving up the road. It was very lucky, lucky that the driver that landed upside down in the creek was not injured or killed. To mitigate this risk, they put down steel plates. Recently, they removed the steel plates and were not planning to fix the area until I mentioned that they were removing the only mitigation to the hazard they created, and they could not take the plates without fixing the road. Again, they put more base rock on this area and walked away. They offered us a, sell they offered us a settlement of $4,600 for them to walk away. This was not only insulting, but also inadequate. During this whole period, they had been telling us they were applying for permits to fix the road, which they had not done. Permitting alone to fix this section of road I have been told can be up to $40,000. They did not apply for permits until we refused the settlement. We were also told that we should take the settlement because all the other communities had done so and we should not be difficult. Dealing with Anvil, Cal OES and Santa Cruz County during this process 
has put undue stress and financial burdens on the community members trying to rebuild. I urge you to hold Anvil accountable and also to hold Cal OES accountable. Anvil is a for-profit company, so their greed is to be expected. Cal OES did not take the time to oversee Anvil construction, and I would like them to be held accountable as well. Thank you. I'm John McKeon. My wife and I have a long-term residence off Last Chance Road. Um, for the past seven years, I've been one of the two people involved with getting proposals um, for obtaining paving on the front section, 1.2 miles of Last Chance. So when it come time, comes time when this successful process uh, reaches its conclusion to determine the expenditures for that section, I have some proposals and information that may be useful. Um, also, um, no one seems to be talking about the retention holdback provisions of the contract. And it seems to me if the contracting agency doesn't use its retention leverage to enforce the as good or better repair provision of this contract it is clearly in dereliction of its duty to the taxpayer. And there's no additional use of taxpayer funds involved here. We are really allocating between a private contractor's profit and the damaged private holders. So something should, I feel, be actively done involving the retention provisions of that contract. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman, members of the board. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for taking this issue on on behalf of the residents and uh, residents of the county as a whole, and specifically some of the private residences that, that you're hearing from today, and also from the county for doing the work and getting out on the ground and, and doing assessments so that there's something uh, qualitative that, that can be looked at. Um, I work for Redwood Empire Sawmills. My name is David Van Lennep. I'm a registered professional forester, and we're associated with uh, two of the roads that have made it onto your report, Baronka Knolls and Old Woman's Creek. We've been associated with those road systems for 25 years. Uh, particularly Baronka Knolls was in a very serviceable condition, uh, condition that could be maintained by the residents, had been put in a, a good serviceable condition through a Department of Fish and Game grant 20 some years ago had a lot of rock, had good shape. Uh, Anvil came in, took the, so the top six to 12 inches of the road off, pushed it to the outside edge, changed the shape of the road. Uh, they were alerted to this, warned about this, and ensuing meetings and um, kind of the, the stop work was put on by the road association. Anvil was told not to come in and do any more work, any of the cleanup or any access until there was an agreement about how the road was gonna be treated after the fact. and. The story is the same. Uh, we were we were made handshake and verbal agreements by both Anvil and Cal OES that the road was going to be put back to some reasonable condition. It may not be perfect, but it was going to be better. Um, that rock was going to be brought in, shape was going to be put back in the road, and the road was going to be returned to some serviceable condition. That work was never done. Uh, we were the Cal OES folks took the the path of least resistance, whatever they could say to get the work to move ahead and. Then they wash their hands of the whole road system and the residents of that road system have no means to put it back together. And you've heard that story many times this afternoon or this morning. So please continue to endeavor uh, to get this resolved through Cal OES and we appreciate your efforts. Thank you. Thank you for your efforts too, for helping the county and some issues in the past. Uh, hello, board. Good morning. Uh, my name is Mike Duffy. I'm a forester for Redwood Empire. I've spent the last, well, I spent since October in the burn, mostly during salvage operations, and spent a lot of time trying to restore our roads, our forest infrastructure to handle the rains coming this winter. Uh, when we first encountered Anvil, they had bladed off our road, created berms, uh, in sloped roads that were once outsloped. And it was clear to us they neither understood the forest practice rules, nor did they understand rural forest roads, uh, especially roads that had not been paved. So it takes an inordinate amount of effort uh, and diligence to keep your road surface, your rock, everything functioning. And that was bladed off, uh, frankly, before the contract really was even arranged. 
And once we pointed that out, what they were told, they told us that they understood the forest practice rules. Uh, I, the forest practice rules are my career. And if you do something that's blatantly against the forest practice rules and tell me you're following the forest practice rules, that's a tell. Uh, the, soup, the, the contractor didn't, they were out of their element, but I could tell that from day one. I don't blame the contractor. Cal OES made promise after promise after promise and never had any intention on following through. And I don't understand that. I don't understand why a state agency made promises that they had no intention of following through on. It, it doesn't make sense. So I just want to come, I guess, forward with Santa Cruz County is not alone. San Mateo County is going through the exact same thing right now. And I imagine wherever these operations are occurring. So I, I would suggest you reach out to those other communities, those other counties, because Cal OES probably is not gonna listen to one county, but they'll listen to everybody. So thank you again. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Areta. I'm from Catholic Charities and we work directly with survivors. And the reason why I'm here today is uh, supporting our clients and all the survivors. Uh, this is an issue that we see every day and it's a common issue that we hear every day and uh, needs to be addressed uh, in order for people and the community to move forward and be able to rebuild their lives because they are not rebuilding a home, they are rebuilding their lives back. So I, I will appreciate um, the time and uh, you know the opportunity to be here and thank you so much. Hi, my name is Kat. I came in earlier, but uh, with a doctor's note and I was discriminated against. I find that appalling because for a board that likes to talk about inclusivity and uh, um, non-discrimination, you actually would not allow me to be in this building. So that said, I wanna say, it's hard for people to hear me. This does not prevent transmission. I came here a year and a half ago to tell you this. Please. The vaccine does not prevent acquisition of the virus We're or transmission. Subject. It is an experimental product. Let's I push. am very concerned. You concerned about the out there for our children right now. They're That's experimental products. They're following Damn. an agenda. They are the code, the CBPH. Uh, we're on the like subject of last chance road, please, ma'am. Six months and up. These are experimental products, liability free products. I want people to be aware you are all complicit in injury and death for all the young children that you Thank are you, pushing these vaccines on. Please leave the vaccination playbook. Please, everyone, check it out. You're all complicit. How do you sleep at night? You are responsible. Right. Think about that. Wait, sir, this please. timer doesn't work. Go ahead, please. You know, I don't know how I could really top what was just been said and what has been said by about 20 Let's just other- just stick with the subject of Last Chance Road, please. Yeah. Thank you. 20 other citizens about the last chance road. You know, Homeland Security, fighting terrorism since 19, since 1492. What does this have to do with last chance road? I spoke in front of this board on September 15th, 2020, about the cause of these fires with the CZU fire and all over the world. So that's available on YouTube under James Ewing, under my personal um, presentations. I took notes on what stuff was going on here, you know. Quotes like Anvil was the fox guarding the hen house because they're a private corporation for profit that's working for the state. You know, I think it's great that FEMA is presenting all this money to help fix things that FEMA caused. Uh, please check out that video. Um, why is any citizen surprised by the red tape and seeming lack of accountability in so many government agencies. You know, since the CZU fires between 15,000 and 23,000 of pages of legislation in this room have been rubber stamped by you guys. Because you guys are just puppets of other corporations and foundations. So I think it's great that there were so many people in the public that were citing their concerns and also their compliments. I sure wish I had more compliments for the members of this board. Yeah. 
can bring Mike down just a little, please. Thank, Thank you. you. Hello, Christine Harper, White House Canyon. I've lived there all my life. My husband was the road manager for 30 years. His father was before him for 30 years. 30 year uh, retiree of granite construction operator, greater operator. Um, I have a picture today I'd like to submit, and this is the anvil truck that went in our creek, and we're not able to get our fire clearance until anvil fix this fixes this part of our road. And I'd like to hand this over. Um, this was actually our debris cleanup started in January, and that was winter. And they did start in January because our road was stated in very good condition. Um, and I spoke to Sean Pippen, the, the superintendent of the job, and I asked him not to break the crown, break the seal, plug the culverts, fill in the ditches. He did all of that and he said he was gonna do it his way. This was how he was gonna do his operation and then bring our road back. Our road has not been back and we lost a lot of years. In my lifetime, 60 years of repairs, a lot of money that our residents, 30 houses, 20 burned, and we'd like to rebuild, but we need your help, please. I'd like to be in a house again. Thank you. Is this the uh, last person here in the audience that wants to speak on this subject? And do we have any callers? Can we do, we have four via Zoom. Okay, we have a scheduled item at 1045. We wanna complete this item. And item number nine will go into the afternoon because that item on two, uh, 1045 is going to take some time. And then we go into closed session. And I would guess on item number nine, we will not be discussing it probably until two o'clock, something like that. Go ahead, sir, please. Thank you. Um, the quarter billion dollars that was awarded to Anvil in order to help with the debris removal um, seems to have been um, maybe poorly managed. Uh, I want to bring to attention the, the catch-22 that you can't rebuild your house without getting the fire regulations complied with. So these are being preventative damage to the people who are, who are trying hard to get permits. And even so, the permit process with the planning department is also a cost, which is preventative for people to come back. Um, when you follow the money, it's about whether or not the state is responsible. Sounds like this is gonna have to go to a state level. Um, the FEMA money that's perhaps out there, perhaps to be applied for is uh, yet another lengthy process. Um, being part of the Last Chance Road community um, has been very rewarding to me over the years. Uh, I understand that there's a pilot program for three years extended to the people in order to get through this planning process. I ask that that be extended. I ask that it ex be extended to at least a decade because this is how much damage has been done to that property, to the road, to the access. If we are not given that much time, many of these people may have to abandon their properties. And as it also applies, there's state park access to that area. It was taken away from us a few years ago when two, two miles of the rear part of our road was recontoured, making it a one-way road, eight miles, seven miles long. That means people can't get in or out. And with the new regulations, of there being a limit of a one mile access road, this is an oxymoron. It, it, you can't have it both ways. So please consider all these. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The um, callers, we have four. Sorry, I just forgot oh, to submit my letter. You want to yeah. submit, anybody can submit their letter or if they wish to the clerk. Uh, but go ahead, please. Caller 2915, your microphone is available. Thank you. This is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. I commend the, uh, the board for taking this action, public action, and their uh, stated recommendations to contact Governor Newsom's office directly. 
I also want to ask that you involve State Senator Laird and Assemblyman Stone. These are their areas, and their help will be imperative and very forceful. Um, I'm, I also think that um, State Parks should be held accountable for closing off the access for this community and that this board should likewise take direct action to demand that that, that emergency access be reopened. It was the cause of a death, and that is unacceptable. So please include that in your actions and requests of the state and state legislators and of the governor. What will happen if Anvil simply throws up its hands and walks away? What will be the backup plan for getting these, these people made whole and addressing the millions of dollars of damage that Anvil has done? I think we also need to look at that because judging by what I've heard and read, Anvil is not a reputable company and will simply skate away. <clears throat> and the people will be left no better than they are before you here today. Thank you. Sarah Polgar. Hi, um, I want to thank the board and staff for taking this um, issue on, assessing and summarizing the issues um, and taking action. My name is Sarah Polgar. I'm with the San Mateo Resource Conservation District, and my colleagues and I have been uh, working with and trying to advocate for landowners affected by the damage that Anvil did and that Cal OES oversaw in San Mateo County. Um, these are the Barranca Knowles communities, uh, Old Woman's Creek, uh, as well as White House Canyon. These are the roads that cross county lines. You've heard from these residents uh, and, their, and the businesses uh, about what happened um, you know, with Re uh, Redwood Empire. They, uh, Mike Duffy and Dan, David Van Lennep, uh, Julia Rivera, and Christine Harper from White House Canyon. Um, you've heard their stories and you really, so many of them lost their homes and really all they had left was their roads and now that's taken away from them too. And so this is uh, just so important and we strongly uh, support, the San Mateo RCD strongly supports this count, Santa Cruz County effort uh, to address the situation and hold the state accountable. Um, and we look forward to coordinating with and helping in this effort. Um, thank you again. Lisa Warren. Good morning, thank you. Um, I am part of a family who has owned property and a home in White House Canyon for over 30 years. And I wanna thank the board and staff for presenting this. I also wanna thank the neighbors in our community who have spoken and written. I'm really glad that Julia's letter was read. There is also a, a posting from, um, Kathy and Jim Worley that I hope you read. And I, I heard some things, well, first of all, you've gotten a very good account of what happened in White House Canyon from the people who know best. And I'm of course involved in email strings, but I don't live there full time. So I follow what I can and I trust wholly in these people who have spoken to you. And I think there are others like me that couldn't be here that would say the same thing. Well, I know there are. So, and I thank David Reed specifically because he's um, the one person that I've had the most exposure to and he's been as helpful as he can be and, and truly listens. So thank you for that. Keep going. <laughs> I heard Mr. McPherson that there needs to be continued advocacy. Advocacy is critical and I can't emphasize that more. I hope that that is the theme for all of you. He, I believe it was he that said, right now, residents are in the middle of a battle. That of course means that the county should be in the middle of the battleground along with those residents, including my family and our community there. I, someone said, a speaker, I believe, that the ROE is in conflict with the contract, which is blaringly obvious to me. And I don't know why there's even discussion still happening and more forceful actions haven't been taken. Um, I know it's a process, but really that process needs to speed along, please. And thank you all again for your time. Caller 7551, 
your microphone is available. We see that you have unmuted. Caller Hello? 756. We can hear you. I'm Kerry Beanstra, president of the CSA 47 Bremer Drive Road Association. After the cleanup following the destruction of 37 of the neighborhood's 52 homes, the state of the road is worse than anything I've seen in the last 18 years. There is damage to the road, to pavement edges, and to driveway culverts. Repairs go beyond our budget. I and residents of CSA 47, thank you for anything the board can do to support us in dealing with the situation. Thank you. This is the last call for any Zoom speakers. Sorry, Chair, there are several hands that come up and down. This is the last one. Angie Garez, your microphone is available. Great, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect, so this is Angie Garez from the Resource Conservation District in Santa Cruz County. Um, and I just kind of want to echo what Sarah said from the San Mateo RCD. We have had a lot of folks reach out to us. We do have some funding to help with repairs. We are stuck in this limbo because if the state is responsible, our funds can't go towards that assistance. So it's a struggle for us in trying to help landowners. We have seen some of the damage that we've been called out to look at. And we saw the roads um, previously when landowners had done a lot of great work over all these years. And it's it's just disheartening to see that and know what folks are already going through. So we want to echo our support um, for moving forward. And then I think I would just also want to make sure that if Anvil comes back to repair those roads, that there is some accountability that the roads are put back correctly um, in the way that they were done before, the grading that was done, et cetera, and not just some, you know, hodge, you know, bad repair. Um, and I don't know how to keep that accountability, but make sure that that's somewhere in the conversation. So I think that's it. Okay, that will complete the public comment. I just wanted to ask um, Mr. Reed or Mr. Machado, do you have any brief comments? There was several uh, continuous uh, really uh, comments that we had. Uh, but do you have any basic comments to before we go to the scheduled item at sure, 1045? I, I would just be brief that um, they validated really what we've seen out there. And so um, I think we hear everybody clearly, and that's what we'll be advocating for uh, with your board action today and with subsequent scheduling of meetings with uh, state officials to advocate the same message that we heard today, because it's our message as well. It's what we've seen and, and heard uh, ourselves. So I think it's all very consistent. Okay. That's right. Okay. Turn it to the board. Um, any comments, uh, Mr. Coonerty, Supervisor Coonerty? Yeah, I'm happy to move the recommended action with the additional direction of the chair reaching out to uh, the governor and our state elected officials um, to add further, uh, amp further amplify the voices and the concerns we have as a community. Any other comments from the board? A I'll second. Yeah, I, I think Supervisor Coonerty moved. Uh, Supervisor Friend seconded. Call the roll, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes with additional direction unanimously. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for coming and expressing your concerns. Um, we'll work on this as quickly as we can. Okay. We will go to now the scheduled item that is um, for 1045. It's a public hearing to consider proposed maps and plans for revised Board of Supervisors district boundaries, accept and file report on the 2000. 21 redistricting process, adopt a final redistricting map and plan, adopt a resolution approving a final map revising, reflecting revised Board of Supervisors district boundaries and adopt an ordinance repealing Santa Cruz County Code Chapter 2.04 and adopting new Chapter 2.05 related to supervisor districts and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the County Administrative Officers we have some attachments uh, regarding Apple Hill, East Harbor, Apple Hill, East Harbor, Scotts Valley, Apple Hill, East Harbor, Scotts Valley, Midtown, and the uh, original proposal from the uh, Commission on Redistricting, Attachment E. Uh, we also have a resolution establishing the 2021 
supervisorial boundaries final uh, and uh, some ordinances uh, referred to 2.04. And we have a presentation from Elisa Benson, our administrative assistant, county administrative officer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, Elisa Benson, assistant CAO and um, team lead for the county's redistricting effort. First, I want to acknowledge and thank the super strong county team we have with Rita Sanchez, Susan Perlman, Matt Price, Jenny Go Gomez, Stephanie Cabrera, Ruby Marquez, I'm, I'm, and we have our uh, county elections clerk, Trisha Weber, who have just been outstanding partners in moving this process along. And they're here with me today if there's questions that I'm not able to answer during the presentation. Next slide, please. This is our fourth, uh, our fourth meeting on this topic and our fourth public hearing. I start with this slide because redistricting matters. This is a significant process we undertake every 10 years as a function of the decennial census to ensure that every dist uh, legislative district um, is substantially equal in population and reflects communities of interest. This is where uh, Redistricting determines neighborhoods and communities that are grouped together for purposes of electing their represented um, members. It's very important that we have community voice as part of this process, as unfortunately, there have been many times in our history where redistricting has been used to disempower particularly disadvantaged and vulnerable communities. So this is an incredibly important process we go through every 10 years. Um, the other item we have to talk about is the, the effect of the COVID global pandemic and how that affected the census data and the provision of that data to this process, which then affected how we went forward with this, this process. The pandemic also, I think, affected how folks were able to engage over the summer as we did take this on as they were dealing with COVID Delta variant and, and also just dealing with the, the process we're all going through with recovery. So it's been, it's an important process, but it's also been a particularly challenging one given the events we've all been experiencing. Next slide, please. Our objectives for today is again, I will review the, the legal context and our process for the county's effort as it is different than ever before. And we will provide a recap of the various public hearings and the uh, input and testimony that has been considered. We'll then ask the board to open the um, public, pu this fourth public hearing to get additional uh, feedback on the items that um, were posted last week. And then we will discuss and consider proposed maps and plans and take appropriate action if you all are ready to take final action. So very, very quickly, you've all heard this many times. Uh, this process, process was particularly different as a function of state legislation, legislation, AB 849, or the Fair Maps Act. Very quickly, starting from the bottom, that piece of state law set forth very specific requirements around how a process, the redistricting process could go forward. First and foremost, very strong record keeping. Um, and so everything we've done uh, has to be available um, and, and available on the web so people can have access to the materials that were utilized in making this decision. There is extensive amount of public outreach um, in multiple language that is required, which we have undertaken. And then there's specific requirements around the public hearing processes themselves as denoted here on the slide. I'm gonna briefly walk us through the process that has gotten us here today. Our redistricting process for the purposes of supervisorial districts really has taken place in four phases. The first phase, the planning phase for the process was really started in February with the decision of this board to establish an advisory commission consistent with uh, the requirements of AB 849. We built our county team, um, received those nominations from the board for our ARC members and then convened that commission. Moving to the second phase around access and outreach, we. Ex we launched our website in early May, and that started to put forward the community of interest tools. 
Uh, one of the things that's, as I've mentioned, has been challenging typically in past redistricting processes, um, counties and any anybody that is doing this particular type of work has the census data from the start to inform the process. That was not our situation. So early in our access and outreach um, period, we just worked on awareness about what is redistricting and how to be involved. This included press releases, social media campaign. Uh, we developed an infographic in English and Spanish and shared that information with over 200 community-based organizations in August, inviting them to participate in our process and um, asking to come to any forum uh, that we would be uh, invited to, to talk with folks in the community about this. The third phase of our process was a really around involvement and engagement of community. We had uh, four public education and community of interest input workshops. Those are noted on the slide. Uh, we received the data during that period, preliminary data on August 20th, and then final data in late September. And we'll speak to that in a moment. And then really that fourth phase of the process was really the line drawing phase. So based on that input received either through the web portal or in uh, our workshops, our commission actually started doing their work and taking that to develop proposals. They, uh, so that, and I'll talk a little bit more to that um, on the next few slides. 26, the board's phase of this work, receiving the ARC recommendation and then considering additional testimony. Next slide, please. As mentioned, this is the um, composition of our advisory redistricting commission. We have so much appreciation and gratitude for each and every member and their commitment to do this work over the summer and in, in challenging times with COVID. Um, want to just extend our, our thank you to our commissioners for their work and assistance in this important process. I will briefly talk about their role. As we mentioned, they were appointed in April. They really served as the eyes and ears of supervisors. Um, they were heavily involved in the planning and the workshops that we did with the public, but they also did their own outreach within their communities to understand perspectives around questions of representation and boundaries. They spent some considerable time with um, the legislative guidelines that inform redistricting, both federal and state, and those very important ranked criteria are on this slide. Happy to answer any questions about them. And then, as I mentioned, when we did receive that data in late August, they started their conversations and understanding what the implications of that data might be and integrating those with the committee of interest perspectives we had been gathering during the process. They met seven times as a commission, and then they, many of them joined us for the four public workshops as well. Next slide, please. With that, I'm gonna move quickly through the public hearing schedule components of AB 849. Uh, the board is required to have four public hearings, but the law also provides that one of the workshops can count as one of those public hearings. And we utilize the public workshop we did on September 30th in the city of Watsonville in the evening to uh, meet one of those requirements. Um, we are now in the fourth, fourth meeting, the fourth public hearing. Uh, so we are meeting the minimum required public hearings and the schedule is laid out here. As we discussed at last week's public hearing uh, to allow for this meeting to be uh, potentially used as the meeting for final adoption, we did move forward with your board's direction to notice a number of different plans and proposals for your consider final consideration today. And should the board uh, decide to receive additional input beyond today, there is sufficient time in our schedule to add a fifth public hearing if you determine that's necessary. Very quickly, this slide presents current boundaries and the census data that we did receive. So as you can see, uh, we are 
actually within 5% with the current boundaries, which is considered substantially equal and meeting that first criteria. However, as I've mentioned at our previous public hearings, just being within that 5% goal um, is not sufficient. We also have to ensure that the criterias are met. I'm now gonna move forward with a recap of the previous public hearings and the input that has been received and considered by your board. On the 26th, we received the advisory commission's proposals. Those were proposals a and B, one for East Harbor and one for Apple Hill. We also re received a redistricting plan and map from Kay Hallinan and multiple communities of interest form. At the, the meeting that was held last week, there was additional redistricting plans and maps received from B Steinbrenner and from D Tim. An additional community of interest forms and emails were received about the various proposals. All of those materials have been included in your agenda materials, as well as additional materials that the clerk of the board has posted to the website. Last week, we received specific direction from the board to notice a handful of different various maps and plans, and that is listed here. These maps were notified on the, or were noticed on the ARC website on November 9th with a countywide map for each of those plans and then district specific maps and detail maps. So all of those were available in high resolution formats for the public and any interested party to examine. Um, and the GIS team, as we move through the conversation today is ready to bring those maps forward if they, you need to um, utilize those for your reference. Since last week, we have received considerable community input uh, att attachment F to your agenda packet uh, for this item included all of the community of interest forms as well as significant amounts of additional public comment. And then we had additional materials that we re received since the agenda was uh, published on Friday that was posted and was also provided to your board. We have additional copies here in chambers and and I will have to say more and more comments were continued to be uh, posted into the evening yesterday. So with that, I am open to questions about any of the any of the items and um, and then we would move forward with the public hearing. Thank you. I think we've heard that on the board before. So I think I'll go right to the public hearing to see if there is anybody uh, that would like to address us. Hello, I appreciate the opportunity to address the board and your members. My name is Jim Mosier. I'm a retired public health attorney and I serve as the fifth district representative on the advise, advisory redistricting commission, the ARC. I'm speaking as an individual today who is a member of the ARC and I'm not purporting to represent the ARC or any of its other members. I've submitted written testimony that provides my perspective on Mayor Tim's proposal and how it relates to the work of the ARC, which is in your packet. I'd like to just briefly today address what I consider uh, concerns about the integrity and credibility of the process that we are involved in. As I understood my role as a member of the ARC, it was to be, as the staff said, your eyes and ears to solicit public input, review, investigate proposals, analyze data and maps, and working closely with each individual board member, come up with recommendations for your consideration that hopefully would reflect both the public input and the priorities of the board. It's disturbing to me that the board is considering Mayor Tim's proposal about Scotts Valley, a proposal that the uh, ARC did uh, review. I spent uh, quite a bit of time on that as well as a conflicting proposal. You can see in my testimony, my uh, submission about that, uh, without at least asking for a briefing from the ARC about our deliberations and why we did not decide to bring that forward. It, um, it was submitted at the last possible mo moment. Um, as the staff showed, there have been multiple public hearings. Uh, the staff should be commended for the very uh, the very intense effort to reach out to the public. It's hard to believe that the mayor would not have known about this. 
Uh, and it just, uh, it, it, to me, it really um, uh, undermines the credibility of the work that we did as the ARC and the process itself. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Jim Coppas. I live in Ben Loman. First of all, thank you for your public service. I appreciate it. And to all the members of the ARC and the staff that uh, have worked several months on this proposal, these proposals, um, I appreciate all the effort that people have put into this. I just want to bring up a couple of issues. Number one, 10 years ago, this same issue came before the board. And at that time, the supervisors for the fifth district and the first district uh, joined the majority to uh, vote to uh, draw the boundary on Highway 17. Uh, second, the notion of uh, trying to keep municipalities together is not anywhere in the guidelines. It suggests that we minimize the disruption, but not doesn't require uh, a city to be uh, boundaries to be kept together. Had it, uh, if that were to be the understanding, then obviously Watsonville, Capitola, Scotts Valley would all need to be in uh, their own district. Santa Cruz, we would have to minimize the disruption. So that would mean take it down to two instead of three. Finally, the process is important. And for three, a minimum of three uh, supervisors to essentially disregard the process would, uh, in my opinion, really uh, demonstrate a, a lack of integrity. And so I would urge you to uh, follow the recommendations of your commission and uh, vote to keep the line at Highway 17. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jamie Ackman. I'm a resident of Ben Lomond and a San Lorenzo Valley Water District Director, although today I'm here representing comments that are my personal views. I ask that you support the redistricting commission's recommendation not to change any of the district boundaries. As Jim said, the legislation governing California's redistricting process does not require that cities be viewed as a community of interest. In fact, it offers specific guidance on the type of features that should be observed where district borders are to be set. And those features include rivers, streets, and highways. Highway 17 is a clear barrier that separates Scotts Valley's District 1 communities from District 5. In fact, Cal Fire used it as the evacuation border during the CZU fire, clearly identifying the boundaries of the current 5th District as a community of interest. Merely offering support to the communities directly impacted by fire does not qualify Scotts Valley's 1st District neighborhoods as a community of interest. If that were the case, Alaska would be a community of interest as well. The communities recovering from the fire and dealing with the ongoing threat of debris flow are the ones whose interests should be heard. And it's these communities who raised more than 229 signatures to oppose the last minute Derek Tim proposal in just a few days. According to Derek Tim's comments, defending his last minute proposal in the press banner, the true harm Scotts Valley has suffered has been quote, splitting a portion of our residents from the fifth district only serves to dilute our ability to select a supervisor to represent our community. In other words, he would like you to strengthen Scotts Valley's political power at our expense. In the last six months, SLV residents made clear they did not view Scotts Valley as a shared community of interest when they denounced merger talks between the two communities' water districts. You should listen to those voices now. I urge you to support the redistricting commission's work. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you, uh, Board of Supervisors, for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Danny Reber. I'm a lifelong Scotts Valley resident. Um, I also serve on the Scotts Valley uh, Water Board of Direct the uh, Board of Directors for the Water District, and I'm also the Executive Director for the Scotts Valley Chamber of Commerce. Um, however, today I am speaking here as a resident on my own behalf. 
And I did just want to um, make a comment about this. I stood in this very room um, along with many of my other residents 10 years ago, and uh, we packed the room. And um, at that time, we had uh, unanimous support from the water district, the school district, the fire district, the chamber of commerce, all in favor of keeping uh, Scotts Valley in, uh, in one district back then. And uh, without getting the details, because I was very involved in this when it happened 10 years ago, uh, there were the political reasons aren't happening this time. They happened 10 years ago. And in my opinion, it was a travesty and an injustice to, to my community when, when our community was split. And um, I feel that uh, this is an opportunity this time to rectify what was the mistake and the error that was done 10 years ago. And um, I, another thing, a comment I want to make is, you know, I do have a lot of friends and family that uh, live in on that part of the, the road too. And uh, with respect to Director Koenig, I got I even remember when you were campaigning. That was the one of the the you asked what an issue was, and I remember saying that even at the time. Boy, we want to we want to become whole as the Scotts Valley again. And um, anyway, I just would uh, ask everybody to to please consider this. Um, and then also, you know. Um, you know, I don't mean any disrespect, and I thank the committee for their hard work, but I, I the word did not get out in Scotts Valley. I, I gave a report at the Water District to all of my colleagues. They didn't know this was being voted on. Um, and then uh, everybody I've reached out to didn't know it was. Uh, even if you don't decide today, I would, I would ask you to consider it further. I heard there was an opportunity to discuss this in a fifth meeting. But uh, this is a very important issue to Scotts Valley, and I just humbly ask that we can undo the travesty that was done 10 years ago and make Scotts Valley whole again. Thank you. Hello, I'm Chuck Boffman, a resident of the 5th District for more, for more than 17 years. And while temporarily living elsewhere, we look forward to returning to the Riverside Grove neighborhood north of Boulder Creek. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry for that. Okay, I didn't. The way it, or... Yeah, no, that's perfectly fine. Thank you for um, your gentle correction. I've served on the Santa Rosa Valley Water District Board and um, as uh, board president in the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency as the vice chair. And I too want uh, to speak to the redistricting proposal that the mayor of Scotts Valley brought to your board last week. Others have spoken to the issue of the mayor bringing his thoughts on boundaries to the discussion so late. I agree with those. But instead, I want to bring to your attention what are likely unintended consequences of implementing today the change that the mayor wants. His proposed change has relevance to the Santa Margarita groundwater basin and its managing agency. Presently, Scotts Valley residents have representation on the groundwater agency via the city, the water district, and the county. That is at least four representatives that they can contact with suggestions or concerns. This is more than, say, a resident of Boulder Creek has, since we do not live in an incorporated city. Also, I estimate as the first district boundaries are changed, the number of residents in the district will, um, will drop by 2,300 from about 300 to 700. In this situation, the rationale for the county having two seats on the agency gets weaker and should be reconsidered. If the first district no longer had a seat on the city, had a seat on the city seat, on the city, the seat should probably be reconsidered as well so as to reestablish an odd number of seats on the agency board, while also bringing equity to the representation that Scotts Valley has vis-a-vis -vis the unincorporated communities of the 5th District. And of course, there may be ramifications out there I have not thought about. I spoke with a water manager this morning, and they had not heard about this. And I attempted to contact the second one, uh, but was not able to reach them. Um, since the water agencies have not been able, uh, have not been consulted, have not been reached out to, um, I think this should not proceed without the full engagement of such important bodies. Um, and I ran into one of my neighbors um, coming into the building today, and they had not heard about this. So, so this is not the time to have redistricting done when there has not been full engagement with the public. And you should take the time, okay, if something like this is going to happen, to do that, I don't think that can be done in the limited amount of time remaining. So um, there will be more redistricting in the future, and um, it should come back to the board in the future. I'm Derek Tim uh, from Scotts Valley, and I do want to just touch on some of the points today and also thank the county. We've had such incredible work uh, from the from Carlos Palacios and his team over the last 18 months. And I think that really underscores 
uh, the importance of having strong representation from our entire community on the Board of Supervisors. First time I attended a Board of Supervisors meeting like Danny Reber uh, was 10 years ago. It's the first time I gave public comment and was on this exact issue asking to keep our community together. We were split at that time and we felt disenfranchised. I think uh, our, our neighbors and friends in San Lorenzo Valley would feel the same way if today we were talking about drawing a line down the middle of Highway 9. Uh, we're not doing that. And um, uh, what happened 10 years ago could be corrected right now. Legally, keeping of communities of interest together is one of the critical missions of the redistricting process. Uh, our schools, police, water, fire, city services, evacuation routes, they're all in one district. Board of Supervisors should be the same. And you know this process, it has been truncated. It's a shortened process this time. And uh, to that point, the outreach really hasn't happened to our community. Uh, I'm honest in saying I didn't realize it was at this point until I saw that article in the Sentinel. I did not get outreach from the commission, neither did any of my other council members to my understanding. Um, so I'm here today just to ask for you to look back at that map, uh, consider consolidating Scotts Valley again, reunifying it to the way it once was. Um, we, uh, as a community, uh, really uh, feel that, that it's been difficult uh, not to have that level of representation at the county level. Uh, right now we have great representatives, but we might not in the future. And this is our chance to have that voice. So let's get it right this time around and correct those mistakes of 10 years ago. Thank you very much for your time. Anyone else would like to speak to us? We have anybody on the phone? Oh, wait, excuse me, we have a person here. Thank you. My name is John Jameson and I live in Felton. This has only recently come to my attention from concerned neighbors and other people in uh, the San Lorenzo Valley uh, area who uh, are of a different culture perhaps from those in uh, Scotts Valley and uh, have some degree of paranoia about uh, what's being proposed. And so I took a look at the demographics and it looks as though if this were to go through the uh, Scotts Valley, people would move from 10 to 20% of the supervisorial district. Of concern to me personally is that uh, I foresee uh, water wars in the future and uh, Sandler, uh, Scotts Valley is growing. I'm not sure about the um, uh, San Lorenzo Valley, but in any case, if there's gonna be a fight over water, I wanna make sure that everybody gets uh, a fair share rather than um, uh, somebody commandeering the resources. Um, I'm on a private well, so I shouldn't have a, much of a dog in the fight, but uh, the way the world is going, I think uh, everybody ought to be concerned. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in the room that would like to comment on this? Do we have anybody on the phone? Yes, there are 10 via yeah. Zoom. Yeah. Caller 2915, your microphone is available. Hello, this is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. I would like to point out again to your board that there has been nothing about this at all in any of the public libraries. I have asked for that many times. I've asked the library to reach out. They contacted the county ARC, and there's still nothing in the public libraries about this. That's, that's, that's not acceptable, because that's where a lot of people go who would be engaged if they were to know about it. How would the public be expected to engage in something that is so vague, and they don't even know how it could or would affect them? That is unrealistic for social media outreach. Um, I want to urge your board to schedule another meeting. I want to urge your board to schedule that in the evening because the, the final workshop hearing of the ARC was in Watsonville, and last week Ms. Benson could not even give a number or did not give a number, but only said it was a very low turnout. I suspect it was zero turnout. And I, to, to use that as one of the evening meetings that is required, I think is unacceptable. So please schedule another evening meeting for this important issue. Now you've got the public's attention and schedule it in the evening at another date. I wanna say that my uh, handwritten uh, letter that I submitted in person at your special meeting on October 26th has not appeared in your packet until today. 
I want to tell you that the letter that I submitted last week with in person at the at your meeting is not in the agenda packet at all. It was explaining why I was submitting handwritten maps because the the maps that came were not printable from the redistricting website. I my maps were not even discussed. They were not even considered. And by law, you must consider and discuss all maps uh, presented to you. And if you don't accept them, say why. None of that happened. Mr. Coffas submitted a very good, some very good maps Thank too. You. Other people Thank you. have too. I just want to say that Thanks. I have listened to the October 15th uh, special meeting of the ARC. You need to too, because. UCSC was a huge piece, is not being considered. Mr. Mosier did Thank not you. want homelessness included in the District 5, and that was the argument about... Thank you for your comments. Ron Seckel, your microphone is available. Hi, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for letting me speak. I'm Ronald P. Seckel, longtime resident of the San Lorenzo Valley, retired enrolled agent and the chair of the Santa Cruz County Treasury Oversight Commission. And this is my personal opinion. First of all, I commend the process of redistributing uh, of the committee and um, get San Lorenzo Valley and Scotts Valley are two very different areas. If anything should change, in the beautiful San Lorenzo Valley, we have much more in common with Bonnie Dune and Davenport. And while if consolidation does happen, the half of Scotts Valley that is in the fifth district has much more in common with the first district. Uh, but as we exist, there are no compelling reasons to change boundaries. If there is a compelling reason that seems to require this change, uh, we should disclose what it is. Thank you very much. Email nbbm at cruzio.com. Your microphone is available. nbbm at cruzio.com. Okay, we are moving on. Caller 1965, your microphone is available. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. We can hear you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, good morning. I, uh, my name is Jessica. I live in District 5 in Boulder Creek. And I just want to echo many of the sentiments that have already been stated that the San Lorenzo Valley is very different than Scotts Valley. Um, and I, I would hate to see um, I would hate to see our district suffer um, just so Scotts Valley can benefit to having unification. Um, you know, I really appreciate all the work that's been done by the committee. Um, and I just would urge the board to take another look and really think about um, a new map that keeps San Lorenzo Valley closer to um, closer to the rural ties that it should be and not mixed with the entire city of Scotts Valley. Thank you. Laura, your microphone is available. Thank you. Good morning, buenos dias. Laura Segura, Executive Director of Monarch Services. First of all, I just wanna thank you all for the work that's been done so far in this effort. However, many of us, have you, as you've heard from so many others, were not informed of this process. And I also, I consider myself a pretty informed um, citizen. Redistricting is an equity focused exercise exercise protected by the Voting Rights Act and prohibits plans that discriminate on the basis of race, color, or membership in a language minority group. While we know there has been South County representation on the commission, it's concerning that there were no representatives of the Latinx community on the commission, and the lack of representation will impact the redistricting plan. The commission should accurately reflect the racial and ethnic character of our county, including South County. Without proportionate risk representation for the Latinx community on this commission, Santa Cruz County cannot fulfill the promise of its most fundamental right of equal political participation. 
So in the spirit of the Voting Rights Act, we request that the county host a Zoom town hall with interpretation services and sufficient outreach for authentic engagement with the Latinx population around this issue. The plan allows for communities of interest and the city of Watsonville has not had ample discussion, community input, nor support to conduct this analysis as, as part of the county process. We request including countywide engagement on this on this part of the process to deepen our uh, to deepen understanding of this allowance. The South County triage is a perfect community engagement structure that would give commissioners access to over 50 community leaders serving low income and vulnerable populations. Um, it's a strong venue for the redistricting commission to engage, educate, and include more voices in their recommendations. And you've heard from others um, from this group. So we encourage authentic engagement and we're willing to assist in making this happen. Thank you so much. Coco Walter, your microphone is available. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. My name is Coco Walter, and I know a bit about civics and the difference between governance and politics. I believe what happened last week was blatant politicking. The Advisory Redistricting Commission started its work in July of this year, and I did participate. I knew it was happening. Mayor Timms never participated in the process with the commission. He then jumped straight to the head of the line when he brought it up before this board last week. And I'm sorry, that just reeks of entitlement on how that was allowed to happen and be brought forward. Mayor Tim wants Scotts Valley to be reunited without the separation of Highway 17. There's no precedent for this change. The cities of Santa Cruz, Capitola and Watsonville are all split up. Others have asked for unifications of their cities and been told no. Why then is Scotts Valley the only one to be unified? So I, I have real questions about that. However, whether Mr. Tim in the future decides to run for supervisor in either the first or the fifth district, we will be watching this behavior that was unprecedented last week. Um, and I was absolutely appalled. Anyway, thank you very much. Judy Darnell, your microphone is available. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm Judy Darnell, a 42 year resident of the San Lorenzo Valley. I worked at Valley Community Resources, now Mountain Community Resources, and as a Healthy Start Director for the San Lorenzo Valley Unified School District. <clears throat> I too am in strong opposition to Mayor Tim's proposal and ask that the board reject this proposal to consolidate all of Scotts Valley into District 5 and adopt the boundaries as proposed by your redistricting commission. It would give the city of Scotts Valley an outsized influence over the 5th District, and they already have a city council to represent them. I had faith in the commission, especially our representative from the fifth district to review carefully and to develop a recommendation that was consistent with our need for strong local representation as a community of interest facing unique challenges. San Lorenzo Valley faces national, natural disasters, recovery and economic and social realities, including isolation, transportation issues that differ from the city of Scotts Valley. I can assure you that the San Lorenzo Valley residents do not share a community of interest with Scotts Valley residents. If any lines were to be withdrawn, it would make much more sense to be joined with our rural neighbors to the north like Bonnie Dune and Davenport. Um, after recent events over the past year, such as the CZU fire and potential debris flows and evacuations, it is obvious we have many issues not shared by our Scotts Valley neighbors. Um, I thank you for this opportunity to speak to you and hope that you take these concerns into consideration as you make your final decisions. Thank you. David VB, your microphone is available. Uh, hello, can you hear me all right? Yes. Great. 
Uh, yeah, so it's a little hard to follow, but it, it appears that after months of public process at the second to last meeting, a new and different proposal was submitted by uh, one or two of the supervisors. And uh, this proposal was influenced largely by a resident who would, as a result, change districts. So that's not disinterested. And if I'm reading the agenda correctly, the resolution on the agenda is to approve this last minute map. And it might be favoring a candidate, Mr. Tim, potentially. Uh, 200 citizens signed a change.org petition against adopting this late redistricting proposal. Uh, Gary Patton even supported that uh, change.org. The compressed timeline of this last minute maneuver makes the public participation seem a little bit silly. It circumvents the advisory commission and their process. And lastly, uh, today's agenda link to the November nine minutes doesn't actually work. So I'm sure that this is all pedantically and scrupulously legal and the new proposal map wasn't literally drawn in Sharpie, but it, it feels to be not in the full spirit of transparency and engagement. I urge you to uh, defer the vote on approving this last minute proposal or better yet, support the commission's disinterested analysis. Thank you. Caller 6578, your microphone is available. It is star six to unmute. Good morning. My name is Nancy Macy. I live in Boulder Creek and have lived here with my husband and family since 1974. I've been very involved in this process and was excited to see how it went and uh, watched it watched it happen and was was remarkably impressed. I'm distressed to hear that there are some important uh, people who have not heard about it, but that it just totally shocks me that the mayor of Scotts Valley would not be aware of a redistricting process. We actually returned from a visit in Southern California and uh, helping out family members to an article in the press banner that touted the totally inaccurate idea that Scotts Valley needs to be kept intact to be well represented in local government. Keep in mind that no other city is represented in whole in one district in the county which is actually a good idea because the cities are already represented in so many ways. Uh, the article also misrepresented the process. So people in Scotts Valley reading the press banner or people in Boulder Creek reading the press banner might think that this was a legitimate uh, step in the process and that there still would be ongoing public meetings and so on. I think you need to reread that article in the press banner. It is totally inaccurate. Um, it failed to let the leader know that the proposal was slipped in at the last minute when it could have been thoroughly vetted, thoroughly evaluated during that four-month process. It was a manipulative attempt to subvert the well-publicized and well-designed process. Um, those slides showed a lot, and a lot of organizations were contacted. Um, you know, the number of organizations obviously needs to be expanded. But at the same time, residents of Scotts Valley have their own city government, their own water district. The city council itself has a voice as an entity with the county. It's a very strong voice. You can be sure that the 5th District Supervisor has been and is responding to the concerns of all those living in Scotts Valley with due diligence. This new scenario that has been fo foisted on the board at the last minute threatens to overwhelm the concerns of the San Lorenzo Valley, which really are different as it's been stated previously Thank by you. other very articulate speakers. With the population of Thank the entire you. city crammed, at, uh, I'm just about done, crammed into one district, this already well-served population will have an either greater impact on county elections, inevitably reducing the voice of the San Lorenzo Valley in the only local government it has. Thank you so much. Sorry to. Caller Sean, your microphone is available. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Sean. I have volunteered with the disabled and special needs communities of Santa Cruz County for almost 20 years. Um, I'd like to say that I oppose this last minute proposal. Um, I'd like you to please support the commission's recommendations instead. If, um, if this body is not willing to cooperate and include South County, um, it, I think it would suggest that's because they know Watsonville knows what's good for Watsonville. And, they, and uh, 
the residents show up and they return surveys and they vote. They're effective and they're progressive. Thank you. There are no other speakers via Zoom. Okay. I apologize, Chair. Barry Scott has raised his hand. Barry Scott. Barry Scott. The last call for Zoom speakers. Barry Scott, your microphone is available. Ah, thank you for uh, thank you for permitting me to speak. I agree with. Um, David Van Brink and other speakers that this last minute change uh, that would permit uh, the mayor of Scotts Valley to uh, be included in Mr. McPherson's district suddenly. And uh, it's my understanding that the mayor has an interest to potentially in running for supervisor is, um, is unfortunate and uh, has, has the appearance of um, whether intentional or not, of manipulating the process to serve a particular political end. And I think that we should uh, support the commission's recommendation and uh, dismiss or reject this last minute proposal uh, that, that could potentially influence the outcome and the future of our, uh, the outcome of elections and the future of our county. Thank you. There are no other speakers on Zoom. I don't think anybody has come in late to address the board. Okay, I'll return it to the board and make some initial comments. Uh, first, I wanna thank our area districting commission uh, staff members and the public who, who participated in the process. Uh, had over half a dozen meetings and workshops and I think the commission's process of analyzing the census data and considering the public's input and reviewing the various options uh, really needs to be respected. All of the unincorporated cities within the county are currently represented by two supervisors and in one case Santa Cruz by three. And the commission is recommending continuing that structure which has proven to work well in my opinion. Each of the cities already has one primary elected body that represents their interests of work as a whole and that role of theirs uh, in the city council. Keeping each city within two county supervisorial districts, uh, I think is in the best interest of each city and the region as a whole, because it engenders across the aisle cooperation on regional decisions that affect each city and it bolsters each city's ability to receive partnership from the county. Give a few examples of that. There has been terrific regional cooperation on a ongoing water management planning process uh, the Santa Margarita Water Management Agency, some transportation projects, and Community Choice Energy. And I want to thank Supervisor Caput, and especially for last week, mentioning that during our last meeting, he was concerned about the perception that politics was at play regarding the late addition of suggested map, uh, map changes. And I think that input I'm receiving from others in the community, and I think the board should be mindful of those perceptions. I voted last week to get more information on this. Uh, and now that we have it and additional public input with five proposed maps, not just two, uh, I will not support those late submissions. And I wanna support the commission's original proposal, which is plan E. Um, and be because of the Rosen uh, Rosenberg's rules that we do follow, it doesn't address this issue of the chair making a motion. Uh, vacating, the, I'd like to uh, vacate that my position uh, or make that, uh, that vacate that opportunity to make a motion and defer to Supervisor Coonerty. Oh, sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so uh, Supervisor Mc, Chair McPherson can't make a motion, uh, but I've met with him and talked to him about the issues that face the Valley and San Lorenzo Valley and the district and um, appreciate his perspective. Uh, yeah, so I'd, I'd like to make a motion um, and then uh, if there's a second, then I'll make a, a few brief comments, which is to approve the recommended actions and including plan E. And I'll second that. Okay, and then, so uh, look, I think I wanna say, I appreciate everyone has gone through the process. 
Um, this is not an easy process as we're seeing across the country. Uh, I do believe that it benefits communities and cities to have multiple uh, supervisors who represent their, their districts. I also want to say, just um, to be clear, I thought Mayor Tim's proposal was consistent with what his position and other city, Scotts Valley City Council members were 10 years ago. And there was an opportunity in the process for people to bring forward their ideas over the last week. Um, there's been a lot of motives ascribed to everything uh, that people are bringing forward on both sides. Um, but I think uh, he was doing his job in representing uh, the interests of his community and bring them out forward when the county redistricting process uh, invited folks to bring maps forward and we saw several people do so. Um, at this time, I'm not in support of that map, but I also um, want to recognize that I, that it was an appropriate thing to do and, uh, and especially in his role uh, as the mayor of Scotts Valley to, uh, to bring forward what he wrote what his, he considered his constituents to want. But uh, at the, this point, in order to, to have a smooth process uh, and sort of continuity for the, and fair treatment for all the, as all the cities have in our community, um, I'm supportive of the uh, commission's recommendations. Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, I, I, it's funny that we've heard so much testimony from San Lorenzo Valley today. Um, and of course, in the many, many letters we've, we've received, um, my understanding is, uh, is that we are supposed to, in order to honor the Fair Maps Act, take uh, to every extent possible, keep communities of interest together and uh, pay attention to any comments saying that people feel they have a community of interest, including cities, uh, and, and be deferential to that. What we're not supposed to do is listen to other communities who want to split a community of interest. In my, that, the idea that we have to keep all the cities uh, divided, that might be a justification for this process, uh, but, or, or it might be an explanation or justification, but from what I can see, it's actually a violation of the intent of the Fair Max Act, which says that to the extent practicable, practicable, we are meant to keep cities together. I don't think there's anything wrong with the way this process has moved forward. Uh, late submissions, uh, late, it, it's still right on time in order to consider at this meeting. Uh, this board takes actions all the time, which disregard recommendations from lower commissions. Uh, did it recently with the ADU laws uh, that was proposed and uh, we disregard some of my fellow members disregarded the recommendations of the Housing Advisory Committee and the Planning Commission on that. Um, so as far as I can tell, we really, in order to honor the Fair Maps Act, should pay attention to the uh, uh, wishes of Scotts Valley and reunify them. Um, you know, I, 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 wh whichever way this vote goes, uh, I think that the residents of San Lorenzo Valley, I, I find it slightly comical that so much has been said about uh, trying to keep Scotts Valley uh, or the entirety of it out of their district. Nothing has been said about the way the District 5 line dances around uh, in Midtown, going from one side of Stanford Avenue to the other. They seem to have no problem with City of Santa Cruz residents. Um, and look, at the end of the day, you guys are going to have to learn to work together in the San Lorenzo Valley, both and with Scotts Valley. Uh, and it's, I guess it's, it's a representative of the sort of political division we see in the country as a whole today, but uh, it's also frankly a little bit sad. Uh, I'm not in support of the uh, proposed action. Supervisor Print. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I do obviously uh, hear and respect the, the, your comments as well as Supervisor Coonerty's. Actually, let me first by say we're actually really close. I mean, uh, the advisory committee came up with a pair of recommendations and, and actually didn't reach consensus on some of the other issues. It wasn't that they made specific recommendations against the other recommendations. There was no specific consensus reached on a number of other considerations. And our body right now is uh, accepting their two primary recommendations and doing exactly as we were instructed to do, which is hold continued public hearings to consider whether any additional modifications should be made. I'm in complete support of the reunification of Scotts Valley. I don't understand a reason why it, it shouldn't exist. I think that 
uh, it doesn't uh, significantly actually alter the makeup of the fifth district, which it already is about 15% of the population would be about 20%, but it, it really is. Um, and I think we should listen to the elected leaders up there that are asking for uh, this to be harmonized. We're doing the same, by the way, in the fourth district, the addition of the Apple Hill area out of my district into Supervisor Caput's district, which he and I both support, helps bring uh, even more of Watsonville into one community of interest uh, in that area. Um, I recognize that there's a motion on the floor. I think that this body uh, should consider an alternate motion. So I'm gonna introduce an alternate motion. Uh, my alternate motion will be uh, for, uh, I'm gonna make sure I get the right one, which is for plan C, which is for uh, the recommended actions and then for the, this body to adopt the Apple Hill East Harbor Scotts Valley um, reunification proposal. Second. That's a substitute motion. My uh, friend, which will take uh, precedence over my uh, supervisor Coonerty's. Uh, thank you. Mr. Cabot. Thank you. I, I just want to clarify what the, the motion was for, for which one? Uh, which motion? Mine, mine was to accept the commission's recommendation Supervisor uh, Friend uh, with the second uh, from uh, Supervisor Koenig wanted uh, population, uh, see what is number, was it C? Yeah, Plan C, Apple Hill, East Harbor, and Scotts Valley. All right. So, so the, my, my, just for clarification, my motion is to accept the redistricting commission's recommendations and then to also reunify Scotts Valley. So it's just that one additional component to it. Okay, so we, we have a, a one motion is for E as an echo. One one is for Sias and Cat. Is that correct? Correct. And uh, what did you say, uh, Supervisor Friend? Which yeah, my motion is for uh, option C, as in Charlie or Cat. Okay. Supervisor Koenig's. Uh, excuse me, Coonerty's uh, right. is for. Uh, okay. Um, C. Well, C puts the. Uh, e. Excuse me. E. That that puts Scotts Valley back together again. I guess. Okay, and then I, I'm kind of for D, but uh, Apple Hill is my area, so I, I'm willing to go along with uh, uh, C. Uh, if I'm if I'm hearing everything correctly, you want to go be clear. Apple, right. Plan C is Apple Hill in your right. area, Up, Up Hill, East Park. Harbor, which was in the original commission proposal, plus unifying Scotts Valley. Yeah. That's what it is. Uh, he, he, Supervisor Coonerty and I had a motion uh, that would just have Apple Hill and East Harbor. Okay. Uh, so we, we already have one motion and a second, so we have yes. to vote on that. The first. one that we're going to vote on first, or maybe finally, it would be uh, Supervisor Friend's motion, seconded by Koenig, to, for Plan C, Apple Hill, East Harbor, and Scotts Valley. And that would be C. Correct. All right. Is that, I mean, okay. am I okay with that, right, uh, Council? The, <laughs> only, the only reason I'm uh, saying that is I looked at the population, and uh, D is closer to a, an even population. Uh, C is closer also. Uh, e uh, seems to be a little bit off, but uh, again, uh, anyway, uh, let, we'll, I'm ready to vote on it. Uh, it's not my area, but I, I did look at the maps and the most the logical one to me is D, but C is close to it. So go ahead. County Council, do you have a comment? Yeah, bef bef before a vote is called, there is a substitute motion on the floor, which has to be heard first. And that is Supervisor Friend's motion seconded by Supervisor Koenig to accept Plan C, which is represented by a map. And, and for purposes of the clarity of the record, can our GIS folks please put that map, call that map up? So it's clear for the purposes of the record, um, the entire map representing all the county boundaries um, that's gonna be voted on in this motion. I'm sure I'd be happy to do that. This is Matt Price uh, with the County GIS and I will go ahead and share my screen and um, call up map C. That's the one you wanted to see, correct? 
I wanted to see the map that was in the late added items that represents plan C. Yep, and here you go. Okay, this is this is the map that represents the motion that's currently on the floor. Okay, can you just point you at this well understood, I know by the board members, but for the general public, the three areas that you're talking about, just point them out. That's the Scotts Valley, and that's Highway 17 coming down the middle. And that's on correct. the right side or the east side is uh, the in the first district. The uh, west side is in the uh, my fifth district. Um, then go to the harbor. Uh, is that is that it, or is it the? Okay, that that would take a, a just a small portion of. Um, the uh, third district and put it into the first district um, and split at the harbor. And then the last one is Apple Hill, which Supervisor Friend or Caput might be able to explain it more than I can, but uh, that uh, it in essence unifies those districts on a straight line, I guess, is about as forthrightly as you can put it. Is that correct? Does anybody have any board member, uh, Mr. Palacios, did you have a comment? Yeah, the, the Apple Hill uh, uh, reunifies the Apple Hill neighborhood and to Supervisor Caput's district by moving the line slightly from Supervisor uh, Friend's district. So it kind of unifies that neighbor, that Apple Hill neighborhood and Supervisor Caput's district. Okay. Any other comments from the board? Uh, no, the only thing, uh, uh, I, I don't really have any uh, dog in the fight, but because uh, it's, you know, I'm away from it. But C, I guess, is a better compromise to me than E, but okay. Okay. Um, clerk, please call the roll on uh, plan C for redistricting. This vote is for accepting staff recommendation and assaulting plan C, which includes Apple Hill, East Harbor, and the Scotts Valley Unification. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? No. Caput? Aye. McPherson? No. Motion passes That's three to three to two. Um, I hope that Scotts Valley and San Juan's Valley can find a better way than the past to get together. Okay, um, let's see, week. So, so, just before sir, we have a, a number of other um, recommendations that we wanna make sure are addressed. So the, the motion was to accept staff, oh, staff. Okay. all the staff recommendations with Sorry NC, so we're done. All right. Okay. Um, okay, it is just before 12 and we said we'd come back at two. Can we get the, uh, the people from uh, behavioral uh, health services back here at one thirty, so we can come back at one thirty instead of two or one. Yes, we can do uh, one o'clock. One o'clock. We'll go into closed session now. Is there any? Are there any reportable items? No, there are no reportable items. Okay, we will go into closed session now for uh, till one o'clock and return here at the board to discuss some item number nine about the uh, presentation on our behavioral services program. Okay. We'll return at what time? One o'clock. Uh, here. Yes. And we'll get to close session. Close session. So, but we'll come back. Come back uh, open here session at one o'clock for the one item. Okay. Okay. Can, uh, we have about five or ten minutes. Yeah. Uh, let's uh, take. The other two are on. Yes. Okay, it is um, five after one on November 16th, 2021. We are going to address the final item on today's agenda of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors, item number nine, a presentation on the expansion of behavioral health programs, ratif ratify three grant applications to the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA, or the Healing the Streets and Building Hope and Safety Santa Cruz programs and the California Department of Healthcare Services for the new multi-year crisis care mobile units program, except for multi-year grant applications in the amount of $7,945,000 and Seven fifty-five for the SAMHSA for from SAMHSA for the Healing the Streets and Building Hope and Safety Santa Cruz programs. 
the Department of Health Care Services uh, for the CCMU program and the California Department of Public Health with the Comprehensive Suicide Prevention Program adopt six resolutions accepting unanticipated revenue in the total amount of $5,617,189 from the various grants and other funding sources in fiscal year 2021-22 approve an agreement with applied crisis training and consulting in the amount of $473,155 for the domestic violence, emergency shelter, and suicide prevention services, authorized fixed asset purchases in the amount of $625,000 for vehicles to support the CCMU program, approve addition of 23 and a half full-time equivalent positions as a result of grants and the addition of an assistant associate personnel analyst and two personnel clerk technician positions and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the interior interim director of the director of health services. We have the list of services and several items um, that are on the agenda as well, A through Q. So if we could just have the presentation now, that'd be great. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the Santa Cruz Board of Supervisors. I'm Eric Riera, and I'm the County Behavioral Health Director for the Health Services Agency. It's my pleasure to be here today to review several new grants that we were awarded this year um, and review the different programs that we'll be implementing this year and into future years as a result of this new funding. As a matter of background, I want to first um, acknowledge the really incredible work that was done by two of my staff in particular here with me today, Cassandra Aslami and Karen Kern. You could stand for a moment and just let us acknowledge the work that you put into getting these four grants. Thank you very much. Discuss. Appreciate it. In my eight year career here in the County of Santa Cruz, this is definitely an opportune time for us. We've never had this level of investment from both the state and federal commitment of funding to expand behavioral health services in our community than I've seen this year. And I'm very excited to review the current opportunities that we have. And at the end, I'll talk about some future opportunities for funding that are also on the horizon for us. The first grant that I'd like to talk about this afternoon is called Healing the Streets. Healing the Streets was a nationally competitive SAMHSA grant for community mental health centers, of which the county and our community partners are one, to expand community-based services for individuals with a severe mental illness and or substance use disorder. The proposal from Santa Cruz County was really a partnership with a number of different organizations, including the County Homeless Persons Health Project, County Behavioral Health, and our Housing for Health Department in the Human Services Department. The Healing the Streets program will provide direct services to some of the most vulnerable community members that we have in the county. As you may know, based on a recent point in time, point in time count of homeless individuals or people who are unhoused, we have a little bit over 2,100 individuals who are currently unhoused in the community. The Healing the Streets program will be targeting those most vulnerable individuals within that population who are both unhoused, have a serious mental illness or co-occurring substance use disorder with a mental illness, with a geographic focus on the city of Watsonville, as well as the city of Santa Cruz. It's an integrated service model bringing together county and community-based service agencies to engage participants and provide direct health and behavioral health services, as well as housing navigation. The proposal includes funding to serve up to 600 people over a two year period of time. The goals of the project include providing direct integrated services and establishing stable ongoing connection to health, behavioral health and housing providers for that population of focus. 
as well as strengthening our safety net infrastructure and developing more efficient and effective pathways into care. As we've discussed in prior presentations, providing services to people who are unhoused in our community has presented a number of challenges in the past, and not just funding, but questions and challenges around coordination of care. And this specific proposal that was funded by SAMHSA will help us address all of those different issues and challenges that we faced in the past. We've been provided over $3 million for a two year period of time under this SAMHSA grant. The next proposal that I'd like to talk about that we were also recently funded through SAMHSA is our Building Hope and Safety Program. This was a nationally competitive SAMHSA grant under the Emergency Response and Suicide Prevention Program. Santa Cruz County had previously applied for funding under this grant, but we were not funded last year. However, we were informed this year that our proposal was up for reconsideration and we were subsequently funded. This proposal is also based on partnerships with a number of key community-based organizations that will help support the implementation of the board adopted suicide prevention plan for Santa Cruz County. The proposal specifically addresses many of the long-term effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on the mental well-being of our community, as well as the need to implement our county suicide prevention plan, previously adopted, but no funding was attached to it. Through partnerships with organizations such as Applied Crisis Training and Consulting, Monarch Community Services, and County Behavioral Health, a set of tailored interventions will be implemented using these funds. The Building Hope and Safety Program will fund a number of key strategies, including emergency housing vouchers for people at risk for suicide and experiencing domestic violence, up to 150 people under this grant, clinical and community training in suicide prevention and safety planning, up to 1,190 people, direct crisis services and behavioral health counseling to up to 2,500 people, post pension services based on the local outreach to suicide survivors model, the loss model for up to 1,000 people, distribution of a behavioral health packet resource guide to up to 20,000 people in our community, and a public education campaign with an emphasis on needs management and people at risk of domestic violence. Super. We received $800,000 in federal funding to support this initiative over a 15 month period of time. We were also recently awarded a suicide prevention grant from the California Department of Public Health for a comprehensive suicide prevention program. We were one of 13 counties in the state of California awarded funds specifically to strengthen our local suicide prevention efforts. Through the suicide prevention plan that was adopted by the board, we were able to leverage that plan successfully and apply for this funds. Santa Cruz County, together with our public health department, will use this funding to support work and review and analysis of risk factors for suicide and implementation of our local plan. These funds will be combined with the SAMHSA ESRP grant that I previously described, and we received $200,000 over a four year period of time. The largest grant that we received was our Crisis Care Mobile Units Grant, which combined both state and federal funding to expand our crisis continuum of care. This expanded community-based crisis system 
will include additional services for both youth and adults. It also includes for the first time funds to expand our behavioral health infrastructure, including supervisors and managers to oversee program expansion, data reporting and outcomes measurements. The state made both non-competitive funding as well as competitive funding available to counties to apply for based on the strength of their application. We were actually awarded close to $1 million more than what we asked for based on the strength of our application. We've also recently learned that we have an opportunity to apply for additional funding which that application is due in January, and we're considering applying for additional funding on top of what we already received. The CCMU grant actually has four different components, four proposals that we made to the state, which were successfully funded. The first proposal is a pilot program for an emergency medical co-responder model called triage, treat, and transfer. This model will allow for a co-response model pairing a behavioral health clinician with emergency medical services ambulance team. They will perform psychiatric assessments for individuals presenting with a behavioral health crisis in the field that prompted a 911 medical call. It's a very similar model to our highly successful mental health liaison model with law enforcement. And we have the opportunity to pilot this program with emergency medical services. We also, through legislation that was passed in 2018, AB 1795, which allows for diversion to a behavioral health facility or sobering center, have the opportunity to pair this new pilot program with the provisions under that new law to divert individuals having a behavioral health crisis from having to go to the emergency department in the first place and be instead diverted to alternative facilities, such as our community mental health clinics or a crisis stabilization program as appropriate. And that co-responder model with our local ambulance service will be able to do that under this triage, treat, and transfer program. The second proposal that we made, which was successfully funded, is utilizing peers for a crisis response team in the community that would be peer-led rather than professional clinicians. The members of this team would be individuals with lived experience providing crisis support, linkage, and warm handoffs to community programs and resources. They'd work in conjunction with other crisis programs to offer a peer crisis support model in the community. Peer staff would have lived experience and we would also include youth as peer staff. And they would also provide assistance with system navigation to support the individual and their family in connecting with services, which we've heard can oftentimes be a huge challenge, particularly for people going through a crisis type situation. The third proposal is an expanded mental health liaison program in Watsonville. This is based on the success of the mental health liaison program that we have in Santa Cruz, the Sheriff's Office, and also in Watsonville, and provide us an opportunity to add a second mental health liaison for the city of Watsonville. All other jurisdictions that are part of this program have previously had the benefit of two mental health liaisons with the exception of Watsonville. And they've had a strong interest in expanding their own program and the cost of this expansion would be split between the city and county using these additional funds from the state. And finally, the fourth proposal that we made, which was successfully funded, is to acquire vehicles to establish an alternative transport program for patients. We would be purchasing 
actually four vans, um, as well as six cars that would be used as alternative means of transporting individuals to our crisis stabilization program, for example, or our clinic services, instead of having to rely on law enforcement, for example, which is very traumatic for the individual. We would also be using these vehicles, these new vehicles to provide clinical services out in the field, which has been um, done in South County and soon to be in the North County using our mobile behavioral health offices. That's been a highly successful model. It's much less stigmatizing. It offers a private space to do assessments and evaluations of folks out in the community. And the CCMU grant will allow us to dramatically expand that program. As I mentioned in the beginning, there's a number of future funding opportunities also coming our way. And more opportunity for us to expand behavioral health services and connect with our critical community partners, to expand services for schools, children, as well as infrastructure development. One example of this was a CHAFA grant that we submitted on October 29th. If funded, this CHAFA grant will allow us to establish a new children's crisis residential program, as well as move our crisis stabilization program for kids into this new facility. We applied for $21 million in funding from CHAFA, and we're hoping to hear sometime in January that we've had a successful application and we can move this project forward. The future also holds additional opportunities to expand services for adults and um, other infrastructure costs, including rehabilitating some of our facilities, which are in desperate need of repair and upkeep. And with that, I will entertain any questions that you might have. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Rear, um, for your presentation and congratulations to your whole team. This is phenomenal. We've never seen, I don't think, anything like this in the county to address this issue. Um, I'm just pleased that we're selected for these grant funding of these uh, various programs. It's a long time uh, need in our community as well as many throughout the state. Uh, I'm glad that we are, what, one of 13, you said, that yeah. really got this kind of a... Uh, a grant opportunity and success uh, to address mental health uh, along with what substance use disorder and homelessness. Um, and again, I wanna thank your team. I, I wanted to ask quite, usually I hear of the homeless population about a third are suffering from mental illness or substance use disorder. Is that a general parameter that is probably- Yeah, I, I think that's a fair characterization. As you know, there's a continuum in terms of mental illness and substance use disorders, but um, a smaller group has, are more on the severe end of the spectrum. Right. Um, and then there's a larger group that might have a mild, mild mental illness or moderate mental illness, but serious substance use disorder. And you have the, the four programs. Um, uh, you had some, uh, how, how the measurements are going to be, uh, and that's going to be interesting how you measure success or, you're getting to what you wanted to do or not, uh, but how would that be an annual uh, review of success or not? If we do anything, it's a success to help anybody. But uh, when we get uh, to get a, uh, a review of this, of how well it's working or what improvements, need, would that be annually or every six months? Probably every six months pretty quick. But Yeah, I'd, I'd like to actually call Karen to the podium to talk a little bit about the outcomes and data reporting for the grants in a broad way. So you get a sense of the types of measurements that SAMHSA and the state are looking for under these grants. Hi, right, thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Chair and Board. Uh, so for the Healing the Streets um, program, which is the one that is specifically targeting people experiencing homelessness, that SAMHSA grant is going to be um, evaluated by RDA, which is a um, highly regarded statewide um, agency, evaluation agency. Uh, and the, the, main, uh, the main elements of evaluation come through the GIPRA. I don't know if you're familiar with SAMHSA grants, but there's 
very strict uh, regulations around the information and the data that's collected and it's collected at intake every six months and then when the person exits the program. So we'll have some rich data from that. We've got um, 600 people over two years that we're targeting to serve and we're expecting around an 80% return, meaning that everybody who enters the program has at least a second uh, data collection opportunity at six months. Um, the immediate services that we'll be looking at, uh, which are the integrated with HPHP, going out and providing street medicine services. So actually providing behavioral health services alongside with the health services that HPHP provides now in camps or various places around the county. Uh, we'll be evaluating those services by the type of service um, that is needed by people and the percent of people that are engaged in that service and whether or not that service was received and the, um, the effects of that service were sustained. Um, we're also going to be looking at whether um, social service goals are met. So part of this program will also be providing um, access and linkages to like benefits, for example, if someone's Medi-Cal has dropped, you know, we want to get them re-enrolled in Medi-Cal. Um, the housing navigation services, we're partnering with um, Housing for Health for that. So we'll be looking at all of those services to see whether or not we've, re um, whether we've made a successful transition and warm handoff into those services and whether or not they've been, those goals have been met. Um, and then also just in general, the utilization of health and housing services um, as well as demographics. And then for that long-term system of care improvement, we'll be looking at the actual integration and coordination of care. So we're looking to improve our overall system of care um, and weave a tighter safety net for people. Um, we'll look at data sharing um, efforts. We'll be, there's a, through our whole person care pilot, we we're using a Together We Care platform um, through Activate Care. And so we're looking at using that same platform to track and hold all the data from the participants in this grant um, that'll help us coordinate and then also um, support efficiency and non-duplication. And then we'll also be looking at um, referral response and the, the rate of referral response and those warm handoffs to make sure that they'll be happening. Very good, thank you. Thank you for that summary. Appreciate it very much. Um, Supervisor Koenig. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, again, fantastic work. It's great to have so many resources to work with, uh, and you know, the the infusion uh, is much needed. I'm just curious. I mean, um, Director Rieri, you know, you and I have talked about um, responding to um, various members of the public who want to see more of a mo mobile crisis response. Uh, clearly, we're doing that here, um, but. Um, I guess my question is, with these various uh, mobile outreach services, when, you know, will they be available 24-7? Um, I mean, what, how will the different programs, you know, what hours will they be available? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Thank you. Our, our goal is to use these funds to not only expand the type of crisis services that we have, but also the availability of the service itself. So our goal initially is to at least get to seven day coverage um, for mobile crisis services. We are doing some programming after hours, um, including nighttime hours for a specific crisis program for kids called the FERS program. And it's a mobile crisis program for kids who are in the foster care system. So we're taking incremental steps, but we're doing that with a community partner. Um, because we've actually learned that it's easier to, to partner with nonprofits in the community, particularly if we're looking at after hours and overnight shifts. So I think the future will be some hybrid model between county and nonprofits. And we're, we're taking steps forward in that, but it will take some time to get to the point where we're actually at 24 seven coverage. The state under AB 988 had contemplated requiring counties to provide 24-7 mobile crisis services, but they were never able to get to the point of being able to fund the cost of that program expansion. So these CCMU grants are the first step in that direction, but we would be relying on additional funds from the state to be able to get us to the point where we are actually able to offer them 24-7. The other piece of legislation that I wanted to point out is AB 118. AB 118 is looking at alternative responses to law enforcement for crisis services. 
that's gonna actually be run through the human services department and through a pretty robust stakeholder process that AB 118 defines in terms of who has to be included in, in those decision-making recommendations. Um, and that that's really legislation that's targeting alternative to community, alternative to law enforcement response to crises that happen in the community. So although our proposals have some alternative models, particularly the first responder model with, with our local ambulance companies as an alternative to, to police response. And we have our existing MERT and MERTI programs, which are alternatives. There's strong community interest in, in looking to go even further with that. And so that's what AB 118 really contemplates. And there's no funding attached to it yet, but there's likely to be funding made available in the future once those recommendations come out on a statewide basis. Okay, thank you. And sure. and um, with the uh, clinician gone out with the EMS, with, since with ambulances, is that going to be at hours of highest demand or nine to five, seven days a week? How will that be determined? Um, we're starting with a Monday through Friday model and we'll use a similar methodology that we did with our law enforcement partners and we'll start taking a closer look at call volume and call times to see one of the, the most peak times of the types of calls that we would be co-responding for um, to determine what future staffing levels look like. Again, it's an opportunity to pilot this model. It hasn't been done in this county and we're not sure it's been done anywhere at this point um, to gather more information and help inform how we expand that model in the future. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, uh, Supervisor Friend. Excuse me. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you for the presentation and what is really a pretty historic uh, opportunity, opportunity of investment within the greater behavioral health community and programs within the county itself. You, you know, you outlined a lot of, of potential things or actually specific things that would be done and invested in. To, I think what Supervisor McPherson's point on metrics and evaluation, what would you consider to be really a success? Let's look at a, at a one year in the future from now, if you could outline something that you would specifically programmatically be looking toward uh, that we could also evaluate and the community could also evaluate when this money comes in a success ratio. And I heard um, what your colleague said in regards to how the things would be evaluated, but what would you specifically from an outcome-based perspective view as a success, which we'd be looking for say 12 months from now? I think it depends on the specific type of program that we're looking at. So if we're looking at our suicide prevention programs, our county currently has one of the higher rates of suicide in the state of California. So we would be looking at significant drops in our suicide rate as a measure of success for those suicide prevention efforts. Um, if it's some of our other programs, particularly our crisis programs, we're looking specifically at seeing reductions in costly hospitalizations for folks in the community and, and not requiring that level of care. We're looking at measures around connecting more people to services more quickly in terms of the progression of, of mental illness or substance use disorder. One thing that's of critical importance to us is continuing to build early intervention models. We're trying to connect people with services more quickly than we have done in the past. And there are a number of metrics that we'll be looking at to, to measure that as an outcome. And with the Healing the Streets program, a number of the measures are dictated by SAMHSA. Um, but, you know, again, connection to treatment and other social services supports is a big measure of success for us. We know that given the population of focus, the more we can connect to active treatment and maintaining treatment for that population, the more long-term successes we're going to get from these investments. Thank you. And, and Mr. Chair, just to close on this, and I appreciate those those points, it's clear that there's a, a legislative alignment with this, as, was, as Director Harris was saying, both at the state and federal level of, of how programs should be addressed moving forward. And I appreciate that there's going to be some funding alignment with that. 
moving forward. But it's also clear that in the last two years, I mean, one thing that's been very highlighted through the pandemic is the explosion and need for all these kinds of services across all age groups, um, even ne not necessarily those that were necessarily viewed as at risk previously. I think there's been a, a significant expansion of who would uh, uh, need some of these services. So I think that, that this aligns perfectly with the timing of need that already existed within our community, but exploded over the last couple of years. And I appreciate uh, the leadership of Director Rear and others on his team for, for this work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I appreciate this. It's a lot of um, it's a lot of new programs and a lot of investment, and I appreciate the initiative uh, that HSA has taken to go out and identify these funding streams. And I'm excited about the future funding streams you've um, identified, and if there's any way we can help please let us know uh, those are important to provide the infrastructure that will get to success. Um, it, as I think we all have the questions about the outcomes, I think um, it calls for a bi-monthly report to the, to the supervisors. And I'm wondering just to, just so we're all clear, you know, for each one of these categories on suicide prevention or in those bi-monthly reports, will we have, you know, what the, what the suicide rate, is in was in 2020 Q3 and then what the suicide prevention rate is as these programs go forward and so we can track that hospitalization domestic violence um, some of the other metrics that you just uh, included um, are that, that will those be in our bi-monthly reports we still need to define what exactly will be in the bi-monthly report. And one example that, that makes it a challenge for us is around suicide rates for the county. There's often a significant lag time in getting that data. Um, so it's very difficult to report in, on, in real time on what that rate might look like. However, other measures um, and the ones that we're focusing on in our in our initial reports back to the board really center around the positions that we've established to implement these programs. Are we getting those positions filled? Are we are we getting those programs up and running by the deadlines that have been established by the grantors? so that we can make sure we're not putting any of these new funds at risk. And, and that's, that's our critical path right now that we're most focused on. We need to hire people to do the work for these new programs. If we're not able to get those positions established, we potentially risk losing these funds. Future report backs to the board, we're certainly you know, interested in hearing from all of you what you'd like to have for information in those report backs. We understand it's a really frequent report back period, but we established that because we want to be transparent and open about both the successes as well as the challenges that we're having with these new programs. Yeah, and so, I mean, I think, look, I, I, we, we want you to ramp up and staff these uh, programs, obviously, as quickly as possible, and those metrics are helpful. I think all of us up here are interested in the community-based metrics that we can, our, our constituents don't care how quickly you ramped up and hired people. Our constituents care how many you know, suicides were reduced in our community. And so while there's a lag, I do think it's important that those community-based outcomes be be built into these reports so that we can report back um, on these programs, you know, and, the, and their success. And then also, let's be clear that there are other, these funds will not solve all problems. And so um, to the extent that we need to take new policy direction or coordinate with other entities, school districts or cities or other things, um, if we have those numbers, we're gonna be able to, to take actions to, to better align programs or efforts so we can see the measurable impacts in our community. So, um, so I'm gonna be looking for not only the the sort of program operational reports, but also the some of these community-based impact reports, even if there's a lag, and I understand that some of this data is easier to get than others. Um, in terms of outcomes, one of my, I, and I think it makes a lot of sense around suicide prevention and hospitalization, domestic violence. Um, one of my uh, questions was about the 
funds for homeless outreach, which it it feels like there's a lot of efforts to create linkages and to provide sort of uh, initial health care uh, or, or other services to people, but that there doesn't seem to be the same um, effort at getting to being housed, right? And and I've having lived through whole person care and the Alliance uh, housing navigation programs and ED navigation programs. Um, one of the challenges that I've seen in this community is we've ramped up and spent millions and millions of dollars um, creating navigation programs when there hasn't been a shelter at the end of it uh, or mental health services or treatment beds or other things that that are the the place we want to navigate people to. Um, and so my question is, what strategy are we employing this time that we haven't employed other times so that we aren't sort of providing just enough services for people to subsist in misery and um, unmanaged encampments, but instead are getting people to places where there's they can be successful knowing that we don't have housing stock in this community for most of those people or treatment for most of those people. So how are we going to navigate people to places where they are going to be more successful? Yeah. And, and I would absolutely agree that folks who are unhoused and being outreached by these teams have to have a place to go. And we don't necessarily have a solution to that through these grants, but we do have a number of initiatives that we've been partnering on, including the No Place Like Home program, which are funding additional supported housing units throughout the county. And we have a number of partners that we've been working with. And as the board knows, there are a number of projects um, on the way in terms of developing supported housing. And that's clearly part of the solution that we need. Um, but none of these grants establish additional housing programs through them. That's a much larger issue that that we're not tackling through these through these grants that I described today. Yeah, but I guess I mean I'm wondering in the recognizing the absence of that, and then that that we do want to provide these create these supportive housing um, units, but they're going to they're they're they've already been uh, <laughs> assigned four or five times over to different populations. Do we have a strategy that says since we will not be able to house ninety percent of the people that we are outreaching to, we're going to have uh, we're going to engage in efforts to. Uh, connect them with family elsewhere to find opportunities where they can be more successful in other in other places or uh, find treatment beds or shelters or section eight units that are more available. I mean, I think I think we need to assume that if we can't if we can't find a place for ninety percent of the people or more to go in this community, we have a moral obligation to find a place where they can go. Uh, in another community, and it needs to be built into the DNA of any housing navigation, problem solving, outreach that 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 we establish. I I would agree that all options need to be on the table, particularly for some of our more vulnerable folks. And if there are options with family members in another community that can take this person in, that will definitely be part of our approach. We'll be looking at all options for people because um, it's very difficult to either maintain sobriety on the street or maintain your own recovery when we're looking at a mental health challenge if you remain on the street homeless. So part of the focus of these teams will be able to look at every option that's available to them for that person. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, it's also, it's also even, even if you get those services, it's very, it's very difficult to maintain uh, housing in the most ho expensive housing market, maybe in the world, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, wages. And so, um, so figuring out how to, to get people where they can be successful, I think, needs to be, needs to be foundational in the operational programs going forward. And then hopefully we'll, we'll also get that um, we'll see the efforts and the improvement made in some of these outcomes that, that you'll be getting back to us about, and that they, they need to be to be built into those outcomes as well. Agreed. 
Supervisor Kappen, did you have a comment? Well, uh, Eric, I want to I want to thank you, and I want to thank your staff. Uh, you're all with the uh, the staff, right? Uh, what you've done for South County in the past uh, years is uh, uh, heroic. I mean, uh, the services that are being offered in South County and Watsonville in particular are uh, it's just uh, wonderful to watch and see uh, all the growth that's gone down on that area. Thank you. Uh, part of part of that is everything is sort of centralized now uh, in, in South County, the the part, and uh, people aren't running all over the county trying to get help. So anyway, it's kind of like having all the silos in one spot rather than spread out and people running around. Uh, suicide survivors, I saw that. Uh, a suicide survivor, is that like a family member, a loved one, a friend, or a children of someone who committed suicide? Yeah, a survivor can be pretty broadly defined. Family member, friend, coworker, acquaintance, neighbor. Um, and that's one of the profound negative impacts of suicide is just how many people within that person's circle it can negatively affect. So that's why we're having a focus on, on the people who are left behind as well and providing specific services and supports to them. Yeah, it, that, something like that would be very important, especially for children uh, in a family. Uh, if if, if uh, something like that happened when I was a kid, I wouldn't have been able to handle it. I mean, uh, I'd have to go somewhere and get some help. Yeah. So uh, do you reach out? Do you actually reach out and call families if it if it was a suicide? And yeah, I can um, actually, I'm going to ask Cassandra to come up and, and talk a little bit about the types of interventions that we'll be offering under that program. Good afternoon, board chair, Mr. Palacios. So Cassandra Slami, Behavioral Health, and yes, it's the LOSS model, Local Outreach to Suicide Survivors. So this is a model that's highly renowned in Kings County, and we had a consultant work with us in Santa Cruz County to try to help us figure out how to implement the LOSS model. So this is a team of both peers and people who've experienced loss by suicide who go out and do outreach to those affected. As Eric mentioned, that could be a parent, a child, a friend, a neighbor, or anyone that's kind of in the ripple effect zone of someone who has completed suicide. And they go out with a lot of different information. And we actually just completed the information for Santa Cruz County Behavioral Health. And we're pleased to announce that we'll have that information available publicly on International Suicide Survivors Day, which is November 20th. And that information will be found in both Spanish and English and provides resources and materials for people who experience suicide loss. The team itself goes out and provides this information to people who have been um, met by the coroner or met by the sheriff's department or met by other people who've responded to a completed suicide. And the team, team themselves goes out and provides this supportive resource to those people affected. So that's the premise of the loss model. And uh, I guess the behavioral uh, uh, Mental, uh, mental health uh, facility in Watsonville. With, are, uh, we're still having some trouble uh, hiring what psychiatrists? We are, we're having a number of challenges with psychiatry right now. Our vacancy rate is, is close to 60% right now. Sure. Um, we're working very closely with health administration and the personnel department to develop some new recruitment and retention strategies, but it's certainly not unique to Santa Cruz County. It's a national issue right now in healthcare and also extends to medical assistance, to nurses. Um, it's just a huge challenge for all of us to deal with right now. Yes. Uh, and last, I'll wrap it up. Uh, uh, most of the money, uh, almost all the money is coming from other than the county uh, budget. Uh, is it all state money? Is there some federal money also? Yes, it's a combination of both state and federal funds. 
So it's a partnership between the state of California and the federal government that was passed as part of the coronavirus um, funding packages that have gone through Congress. So they've taken those funds, combined them with additional state funds that were passed in the last budget in California, put them together and then release them through these various competitive proposals that we applied for. It's all taxpayer money. It, it is. comes from a yeah. bigger pool than our county pool. Exactly. Uh, everything, the taxpayers pay for everything we got. I mean, it's amazing yeah. what uh, uh, the, the what the people in this country are able to actually do. Uh, anyway, um, I'll make, uh, do we need a motion? I'll make a motion to approve. Yeah, I just um, to, um, I don't think there's other, any other closing okay. comments. Uh, we need a motion to ratify the, uh, the grant applications. Yes, I believe we have 16 recommended actions under this item. Yeah. So. I, that's, the one, that's the main one, because there's about four or five yeah. of those, of course. But uh, yes, you're right. I have 17, no, 19. I think. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, I don't think we took public comment, or maybe I missed it, but I think yeah. we need to open it up. I just asked, uh, but there was nobody here. So. Nobody on Zoom either? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We do have two speakers via Zoom. Oh, excuse me. Thank you. Mila, your microphone is available. Hello, is that me? Yeah. Um, so I want to say that uh, what I learned about mental health system in Santa Cruz County, that the mental health system used widely by criminals, and it helps them to get away from charges, criminal charges. And I brought my daughter to mental health, uh, you know, since uh, after she got traumatic brain injury, and she was rejected help. You know, and only a couple of years later, finally, my daughter was kidnapped by mental health system in 2014. And ever since, you know, mental health system in our county worked on isolation of my daughter from normal society and alienation from her family. So this is an issue. All those years, I see the same people on the streets the same men and the same females who are still homeless. My daughter was enforced to be homeless also between three public guardian conservatorships and being autistic. And I believe she has autism, Asperger autism, and mental health department refused to do tests and to create the real diagnosis for my daughter. So she gets mistreated, mismanaged, and of course, getting deeply sicker, sicker, and sicker. And now my daughter is homeless again. So 10 years after we're trying to get services, my daughter cannot leave the homelessness because of her workers. And her workers, unsatisfied by California, unlicensed by California, and this is who they hire. And by the way, I didn't find any license or certification for Eric Riera. This is very sad. You know, how a person can understand, you know, mental health and autism if no license or no certification. So we need to see, you know, how it supported the knowledge, you know, and the experience. Thank you. Thank you. And just, I'll get the phone. I'm sorry, I thought you would staff, but uh, let's go for the phone first. Then, yeah. Peter Gelbum, your microphone is available. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I've been, I live in Boulder Creek. I've been working with one of the groups of people that Supervisor Koenig mentioned who were been advocating for quite some time now um, to try to get uh, changes in the crisis, mobile crisis response system, very specifically three things, 24-7, see everyone everywhere in non-law enforcement. And these, these grants are amazing and wonderful and very exciting. Um, I was distressed to hear Mr. Rear's response that it doesn't sound like 24 seven is coming anytime soon. Right now, my understanding is it's nine to five, M Monday through Friday is uh, where the co-responder model is going and the behavioral health consultants riding with law enforcement. Um, 
And I, two questions that I would appreciate uh, either Mr. Rea answering or one of the supervisors asking Mr. Rea to answer. One is um, with the, the loan, the grant that's going to fund behavioral health people riding with EMS, will that be 24 7? Will that be available 24 7? In other words, whenever an ambulance goes out, will a behavioral health person be able to go with that ambulance whatever time of day it is and wherever they're going? And second, I'm really curious about where all these many millions of dollars are going, if not to 24-7 service, um, when there are, they are buying, planning to buy vans and cars, which is extremely exciting, uh, so they won't be police cars. And um, my question is, is there some place in the agenda, in the agenda report, on the county website, behavioral health website, somewhere where I can see a detailed breakdown of where the money is being planned to go? Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, can you briefly answer that? I think you did explain it that you're not going to be, or what you're going to be able to do with what you we have. I, I think it depends on the type of program. So for our MERT programs, we are planning seven day a week coverage. Our current mental health liaison program is seven days a week and also extends into the evening hours. And the coverage for the mental health liaison program was actually based on actual data from calls coming in to 911. And we looked at the specific times when we were getting behavioral health calls coming in so that we could ensure coverage um, when the calls were actually coming in for service. You know, it would be great to do everything at once, you know, and jump right to 24 seven coverage. Um, but the funding doesn't support that, right. you know, and I think it's important to keep in mind what the funding does support us doing and keeping in mind what we are able to accomplish with the funds that we received it may not be everything that we want to do in the future, but I think we're in a great start point. Right. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to mention in closing in terms of responding to those comments. When I started here eight years ago, we had no mobile crisis services at all, so zero. We had no mobile crisis team in the county of Santa Cruz. Now we have a mobile crisis team for adults. We have MERDI team for youth in both North and South County. We have a mental health liaison program with three law enforcement jurisdictions, and we're about to start a program with our EMS system. And so I, I don't want to lose track of the progress that we've made. We appreciate there's a lot more that we need to work on for the future, but we're certainly making dramatic advancements in expanding these services for the residents of the county. Certainly, thank you. You do with what you have and uh, that's great. Anybody else on the phone? Another speaker on Zoom. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. I thought you were a staff member. No worries. Uh, good afternoon, chair and board members. My name is Carly Memoli. I'm a 20 plus year resident of Santa Cruz County and have spent the entirety of my work career on suicide prevention, intervention, and postvention services for our community, most recently as a program director with our local suicide crisis line. As a two-time suicide loss survivor myself, both as a child and again as an adult, I have seen firsthand the devastation that it can bring to families. I have also seen the tremendous power of prevention in our community. I had the great pleasure of working with our local behavioral health leadership, including Cassandra Islami, during our suicide prevention task force planning process in 2018. We had tremendously strong representation from peers, from community members, from public health. We engaged in a very thoughtful, data-driven, community-engaged process to produce the suicide prevention strategic plan that we brought to you and which you approved in 2019. I'm really pleased to say that as we continue to pursue these efforts as a county, what we crafted several years ago is still not only relevant and very much needed, but now is the time. I wanted to share with you as well, um, I'm the president of Applied Crisis Training and Consulting. So we're one of the points in your agenda today is one of the contracts as part of the Building Hope and Safety Santa Cruz Initiative. And if you have any other questions, I'm happy to answer them. There are a lot of helpful community metrics that we can share. 
the loss team, for example, someone mentioned, one of the things that we look at is how long does it take a survivor of suicide loss to get support between a passive system, which is what we have now, and an active system, which is what we're moving towards. So for us, that ends up being an upstream form of prevention. And I'm really excited to be able to work with the organizations in the community that have partnered in this. And I also just really wanna commend county leadership for taking a stand and saying that this is important and it's a priority. So thank you. Thank you very much for those comments. Um, any other public comments? Uh, I'll make a, a, just one quick comment. Uh, I want to uh, uh, note that uh, the wonderful job that the uh, Mental Health uh, Behavioral Health Advisory Board has been doing. And a lot of that is because of what you and your staff have been reaching out to them and uh, they, they are a great resource. And uh, I've had the honor and privilege of working with them. And uh, they, uh, anyway, I, they're volunteers and they're, they're just a wonderful group. And uh, keep in touch with them and make sure uh, we listen to them. Thank you. I absolutely agree and also have appreciated your active participation on the group over the years. There's a real instrumental force in strengthening the work of the Mental Health Advisory Board. So thank you from me to you as well, Supervisor Caput. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll entertain a motion to um, approve the uh, did I make a motion or no? Make well, it maybe you did. Okay, you were uh, I, okay. A motion you to approve the recommended actions. Yeah. Okay. And I'll second and with the additional direction that uh, that staff work with uh, supervisors to develop the outcome metrics for these uh, bi-monthly reports. Very good. Understood. Uh, please call the roll. Okay, this is for recommended actions with the additional direction that staff work with the supervisors to develop metrics. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, that, that concludes our regular agenda, our agenda for today. The next meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors is Tuesday, December 7th at 9 a.m. It's the last regularly scheduled meeting for uh, of this year for the Board of Supervisors. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.